commissioners, the assistant city attorney and city staff essential to the meeting will be video teleconferencing into the meeting and there will be no physical location that's open to the public. The public can, however, observe the meeting while sheltering at home via the Zoom link as the primary means of participation or via the cable channel 26 or live, excuse me, or live stream broadcast as alternate methods of viewing the meeting. Participation via the Zoom link will enable the meeting to be observed live and will enable the public to speak during public comment periods. The Zoom link was published in the meeting agenda. Live public comments are being accepted at this meeting in place of emailed public comments. Public comments may be provided live by members of the public utilizing the Zoom link to participate in the meeting. Utilize the raise hand function in the Zoom application on a computer, a smartphone, or tablet, or else enter star nine to raise your hand if you are dialing in by phone. Please ensure your name is correctly entered in your Zoom profile so city staff may properly identify you when it's your turn to speak. Those dialing in by phone will be called to speak by the last four digits of, the, last four digits of their phone number as shown in the Zoom interface. So with that preliminary uh, information stated, I'll go ahead and ask for a roll call, please. Commissioner Berman. Present. Commissioner Bigstick. Present. Commissioner Godwin. Present. Commissioner Hauser. Present. Commissioner Niblin. Present. And we have Commissioner Leal and Commissioner Ferguson absent. Thank you. Commissioner Godwin, could you lead us in the uh, salute to the flag this evening? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Godwin. So then we'll move on to administrative business. And the uh, first item of administrative business is the approval of the order of agenda. Is there a motion to approve the order of agenda? Uh, Commissioner Berman. I move that we approve the order of agenda. We have a motion to approve the order of agenda. Is there someone who would second that motion? Uh, Commissioner uh, Godwin. I second the motion. Okay, well, we have a motion and we have a second. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Berman. Yes. Commissioner Bigstick. Yes. Commissioner Godwin. Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. Commissioner Nibbler. Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. <clears throat> so next we have, um, as an item of administrative business, approval of minutes. And these are minutes for the meeting of, Oct I'm sorry, August 17th, 2020. September 8th, 2020, and September 21st, 2020. If there's somebody who's inclined to make a motion that, that pertains to each of those sets of uh, minutes, that would be fine. Or if uh, somebody's inclined to have them considered individually, that would be fine too. But at this point, I'll entertain a motion. Well, Commissioner Hauser. All right, let me flip back to the agenda. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of August 17th, 2020, September 8th, 2020, and September 21st, 2020. Great, so we have a motion, thank you, Commissioner Hauser, to approve the minutes for those three dates, August 17th, September 8th, and September 21st. Is there a second? Uh, Commissioner Bigstick? I will second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Berman. Yes. Commissioner Bigstick. Yes. Commissioner Godwin. Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. Commissioner Nibble. Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is a designation of liaison to the city council meeting. It looks like we don't need one at, the, at this time. Is that remaining the case, uh, Mr. Murdoch? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, so then we've come to oral communications. <clears throat> And this is the portion of the agenda that's available to the public to address the Planning Commission on any issue within the subject matter jurisdiction of the commission that is not on the agenda. <clears throat> Excuse me. The time allowed for any speaker will be three minutes. Um, I'll ask at this time whether or not there's anybody uh, who wants to address the commission under oral communications. 
I see no hands raised right now. Uh, we have one dial in participant. Uh, remember to press star nine on your phone if you'd like to speak. And there are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. We'll go ahead then and move past oral communications and that will take us to consent items of which there are none. Is that, that remains the case? Correct. Thank you. So then we'll move then to our first um, new public hearing, which is uh, file number 2018-022, annual review of cannabis retail operation located at 2110 Palmetto Avenue. And it looks like this is MUP 1-18. Um, it's a recommend, the recommended CEQA action for this matter is to determine that it's exempt pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15378 and staff's recommended action is that we adopt the attached uh, resolution for this matter. We'll go ahead and ask for a staff report. All right, good evening, commissioners. I'm assistant planner, Helen Gannon. Police chief Dan Steidel is also present this evening to participate in this agenda item if needed. The item before you is the second annual review of a cannabis operation under the city's cannabis regulations. The subject operation is a cannabis retail operation known as LIT, which is located at 2110 Palmetto Avenue in the West Shark Park neighborhood. As explained in the staff report, staff's inspection and evaluation of the cannabis retail operation found it to be fully in compliance with the city's cannabis regulations and the conditions of approval imposed on the operation by the city. In particular, the operation has not caused public safety or public nuisance conditions attributable to the site. There have been some calls for service and complaints as outlined in attachment D of the staff report in Chief Steidel's memo. I would defer to Chief Steidel for any questions you may have on these phone calls. After receiving public comment, staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt the attached resolution to find the subject cannabis retail operation in full compliance with the city's cannabis regulations and the conditions of approval imposed on the operation. Thank you, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Gannon. Are, are there any questions from uh, commissioners for, for Ms. Gannon at this point or for Chief Steidel? Uh, Commissioner Bigstick. Thank you, Chair. And uh, just for the sake of consistency, this is usually where I ask the Chief. Chief, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the calls for service that um, did occur? I certainly, uh, do you have on Dan Stadel, your Chief of Police? So, Commissioner Bigstick, on, on this, you're taking a look at the calls for service. That Chief, we're getting a little bit of feedback there. I'm sorry. Uh, that sound. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead? Stop me if it's bad. Uh, you, may, you may maybe turn the volume down just a little bit. And I want the record to reflect that uh, Commissioner Ferguson has, uh, has joined us. Is that helpful? It sound okay? Yeah, why don't you go ahead? That's, that's great, actually. Okay. So... Taking a look at the calls for service we had during the evaluation period, um, total of nine calls for service. Um, what I'm looking for in these types of calls are, is there something about this business that's creating a quality of life issue or creating an undue uh, burden on law enforcement resources or doing something in violation of their condition of approval for their cannabis activity permit? And the calls that we saw, some of these calls uh, were the type of calls that you would get in any business. I rate customers not happy with something. Um, I believe there was only one call that had to do with actual cannabis, somebody smoking cannabis in a vehicle out front, which was reported to us. Um, the, the management of, of LIT was very cooperative. Uh, one of the things that we've, we've worked to do with our cannabis business is you know, break that stigma with law enforcement now that uh, now that cannabis uh, recreational sales are obviously legal and we wanted to develop those relationships and Lit has been very responsive and actually invited us into the business for training purposes on numerous occasions. Um, again, mostly what we're seeing here is, uh, is unhappy customers um, smoking cannabis in a vehicle, which uh, a second one, which was dealt with by their security guard that they have on scene. Um, there was one or two for social distancing or public health order violations. Again, not directly related to the business. However, something that we're seeing, we probably have about a thousand of those calls, I would imagine, since since um, since March, since COVID started. So that really wasn't much of a concern to me. Um, 
so really there is nothing of any essence in here that concerns me whatsoever. Um, quite frankly, again, we've we've had a good relationship with the management of Lit, Lit and they've been very responsive uh, to us. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Commissioner Big Stick, anything else? Thank you for that. And yeah, that was my read of your report was that Lit seems to um, be doing everything they can to um, work with you. Uh, and it looks like they don't have very many opportunities to, but when they do, um, you, they call you immediately. Does that seem a fair characterization? That's a fair characterization. In my in my mind, they're doing the right thing. Um, they're reporting what they should be reporting, and they're reaching out to us uh, when they should, which, which uh, to me is it being a responsible business in this community. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bigstick. I don't see any other hands at this at the moment. I, Ms. Gannon, I, I don't know. Is the applicant here, and did we actually contemplate hearing from the applicant at, at this point? Um, the applicant is uh, attending, and uh, I, I wasn't um, aware of whether or not they did want to speak or not. Um, okay. But I'm sure that they can they can raise their hand if they'd like to speak on it. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead then and just move to the uh, public hearing portion of all this. And I think you're right. If the applicant wants to address the, the commission, they, they can certainly feel free to. Um, I'll ask if there are any public comments uh, on this item. There are no hands raised currently, Chair. And as a reminder for our dial-in participants, press star nine on your keypad if you'd like to raise your hand to speak on an item tonight. And there are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. We'll go ahead and bring this back to the commission then. And uh, I'll ask uh, my colleagues if there's any uh, discussion at this point on this item. Commissioner Hauser. Mm, I, you know, I appreciated the fact that it seems like the, um, you know, Lit is working really well with the city and um, I didn't have questions and I thought this was a really um, great staff report and I'm willing to make a motion if there's no other um, discussion. Uh, just let me dovetail. I thought the staff report was great. Um, if I, and very well written, thank you. I didn't leave any of my questions unanswered. I, I did have one little, I don't know if we're going to see these at all in the future. It looked like the, the conditions of approval only contemplated one report back to the to the commission. Um, I was just going to comment, as to table one, I think most of the conditions of approval were kind of evident what the conditions were by the narrative that followed. There were probably, I don't know, six or seven or eight um, conditions of approval where I couldn't really tell from the chart itself what the condition of approval was. Um, might have, the only, the only, it's not even a criticism, but it might have been helpful to, um, to have had maybe a description of each of the conditions, you know, baked into that table, just a, for, for ease of reference. Having said all that, I thought that the report was was really good and it certainly met my needs. Now, we appreciate the feedback, Chair Niblin. Uh, we'll incorporate that moving forward. Uh, reminds me of grade school, restating the question and the answer. So we'll uh, do a little more of that uh, next time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I think um, Commissioner Hauser has uh, indicated a willingness to make a motion. So I'll go ahead and ask her to, to make her motion. All right. Um, I move to adopt the resolution to find that the annual review of the cannabis retail operation is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. To find that the operation of the cannabis retail operation at 2110 Palmetto Avenue, APN 01618-360, authorized by marijuana use permit MEP 1-18, file number 2018-022, is in full compliance with the requirements of Article 48 of Chapter 4 of Title 9 of the municipal code and to incorporate all maps and testimony into the record by reference. All right. Well, that's our motion. And uh, is there a second to that motion, which I'm not going to repeat? Uh, Commissioner Big Stick? Second that motion. All right. Well, we have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Berman? Yes. Commissioner Big Stick? Yes. Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Godwin? Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. Commissioner Niblin. Yes. And that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gannon. Thank you, Chief. Um, we'll then move on to our continued public hearing. Uh, and our continued public hearing is file number 2002-001, site development permit PSD 71402. 
Use Permit UP90402, Tentative Subdivision SUB20402, Authorization for Heritage Tree Removal and Authorization for Logging Operations for Construction of Four New Town House Duplex Buildings uh, for a total of eight dwelling units and associated subdivision for condominium purposes on an approximately 53,000 square foot undeveloped lot located on the east side of Monterey Road, southeast of the Monterey Road and Hickey Boulevard intersection in Pacifica. The project would include removal of six heritage trees and 51 non-heritage trees. The recommended CEQA action for this uh, matter is adoption of a mitigated negative declaration and mit mitigation monitoring and reporting program and staff's recommended action as to the item is to approve it as conditioned. So I'll go ahead and ask for a, a staff report at this time. Good evening, commissioners. I am associate planner, Bonnie O'Connor. The project before you is a continued public hearing of the proposed residential project that includes four buildings, each containing two side-by-side -side townhouses for a total of eight townhouse units. The units would range in size from 1,592 square feet to 1,795 square feet of living area. Each unit would be three stories, including a rooftop deck and a two-car garage. The maximum height of the buildings would be 35 feet. Entrances to the units would be on either the first or second floor. And because of the slope of the site, garage access would be provided on the rear elevation of the third floor of each townhouse. The project is located on an approximately 1.2 acre undeveloped lot located along Monterey Road, approximately 250 feet southeast of the Monterey Road and Hickey Boulevard intersection in Westview Pacific Highlands neighborhood. The construction of the project would require approval of a use permit, site development permit, and a tentative subdivision for condominium purposes. The project would also require authorization to remove heritage trees and authorization for logging operations and adoption of a mitigated negative declaration in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. The project was last heard by the Planning Commission on August 3rd, 2020, and the commission continued the item at that time and requested the applicant to address a number of items, including a high-level garbage management plan, a turnaround area for the off-street guest parking spots, further effort or information to reduce or soften the massing on the northwest end of the project with vegetation, um, further information to confirm the stormwater runoff, exploring the adjacent property owner's interest in or need for a sound wall and description of how the homeowners association will maintain in good condition the landscaping on the remain on the balance of the site each of these items are addressed in the staff report the applicant revised the retaining wall within the front of the development to provide a stair-free path to connect the front of each of the units to the street additionally the applicant has identified locations within the street right of way which would not obstruct a motorist uh, stop distance sight line when egressing from the property um, where a garage or garbage uh, receptacles could be placed for collection. The conditions of approval were revised to include a requirement in the CCNRs to educate and enforce residents of the development of where to properly locate their trash receptacles for collection. Uh, the applicant can also identify the turnaround area for the off-street guest parking spaces. And the applicant has also proposed to replace some segments along the sidewalk, along the front of the uh, property frontage that is damaged. Um, the guest parking spaces were relocated to the south end of the project. The redesigned parking spaces have a drive aisle to allow for adequate turnaround. The turnaround pattern shown by the applicant in the plans is consistent with the turnaround pattern for a 19 foot passenger vehicle as detailed in the American Association of High State Highway and Transportation Officials. Additionally, staff identified an alternative turnaround location that provides sufficient space for a 19 foot passenger vehicle to turn around using a three point turn. A condition of approval would require incidental signage to be posted to inform motorists of vehicles over 19 feet not to enter the site. The revised location of the guest parking spaces would be partially visible from the street, which would help reduce motor, motorists seeking a guest parking space to enter the site if all spaces are used. The applicant has provided an updated landscaping plan with 14 uh, canyon live oak trees. The applicant has proposed these trees that exceed a two to one replacement ratio for the six heritage trees that are proposed to be removed. 
The number of heritage trees to be removed was reduced by one based on an updated arborist report, which corrects the dimensions of a tree that was identified as a heritage tree in an earlier version of the arborist report. This correction also increases the number of non-heritage trees to be removed from 50 to 51. The applicant has provided renderings as shown in the staff report and uh, as shown in the plan, uh, project plans to show the point of view of a motorist or a pedestrian from Monterey Road um, of the project, which represents the softened uh, point of view with the vegetation. The plans were updated to incorporate further drainage detail Drainage on the site can be separated into two categories, existing drainage and the project related runoff. The runoff values for the first category, existing drainage, which would include the existing ephemeral drainage and the stormwater runoff from the undeveloped areas of the project site or adjacent site would directly enter the city stormwater system as they do under existing conditions and would not change. The second category of drainage includes stormwater runoff from the, the developed portions of the site. Drainage from this source includes roof runoff and runoff from other impervious surfaces. This runoff would be collected and treated. The size of the proposed collection and treatment facilities is based on calculations reviewed by the city's consultant and were determined to include reasonable C3 drainage assumptions for the site. As with all projects, these calculations and C3 design features may need further refinement based on building level, uh, based on building permit level designs. The applicant provided a Bay Area hydrology model calculation to confirm the performance of the proposed detention basins and the, result, and the results support the finding that post-development peak flow from the site would be less than or equal to pre-development peak flow from the site. Therefore, there is evidence to conclude that the city's existing stormwater infrastructure located offsite would not be adversely impacted by the project. Um, the applicant has provided their communication with the neighbor at 513 Monterey Road, which is the property located immediately to the south of the project site regarding noise concerns and the reasons for the applicant not proposing a permanent sound wall along the southern property line. The applicant has also incorporated, uh, has supported and staff has incorporated uh, the incorporation of a requirement of for the HOA to maintain the entire property um, as, condition, as a condition of approval. The staff report includes an analysis of the proposed eight unit development under the Housing Accountability Act requirements since the project is one unit below the nine units that the Pacific has housing element accounted for, accounted for on the site. These findings were incorporated into the draft resolution. Since the August 3rd public hearing, staff has received several comments on the project, which staff summarized and responded to in the staff report. Comments generally focused on the geotechnical concerns, stormwater, consistency with the general plan, consistency with zoning and subdivision regulations, and the adequacy of the CEQA document, including technical comments on the biological resources, air quality, greenhouse gases, and geology and soil analyses in the draft IS, uh, in the draft initial study mitigated neg negative declaration. Staff evaluated the technical level comments and prepared a second response to comment document for the ISM indeed, uh, detailed in the city's response. The response to the additional comments, minor revisions, in response to the additional comments, minor revisions were incorporated into the updated errata and mitigation monitoring and reporting plan for the ISMD. Staff has reviewed the revisions to the project under the parameters of the ISMD and determined that the ISMD adequately evaluates the potential environmental impacts of the project as revised. The revisions to the project description and analysis do not con constitute a substantial revision as defined under the California Envi Environmental Quality Act, which is a new avoidable significant uh, effect um, and mitigation measures or project revision uh, must be added. Sorry. Uh, the revision to the project description and analysis do not con constitute a substantial revision as defined under the California Environmental Quality Act. 
Additionally, the city determined after evaluation of the comments received on the ISMD that there was not substantial evidence provided to show that the mitigated effects of the project would have a significant effect on the environment. Since the publication of the staff report, uh, publication of the staff report through 4 p.m. today, 16 additional comment letters were received. These comment letters were posted to the city's website for public view and shared with the planning commissioners for their consideration. Staff believes that the proposed project would provided, provide needed housing within the city, including one below market rate unit. Staff recommends that the planning commission adopt the mitigated negative declaration and approve the use permit, site development permit, and tentative subdivision for condominium purposes and provide authorization for a heritage tree removal and logging operations for the project as conditioned. Staff has arranged for various support staff to be present for tonight's hearing to help answer public, to help answer the commission's comments. In addition to planning and legal staff, um, Deputy Fire Chief Lauderdale, Deputy Director Bautista, sing, uh, sorry, Deputy Director of in, uh, Public Works Bautista, Senior Engineer Don Guinness, uh, Mark Lander, PE Principal Engineer from CSG, Ron, uh, Rod Stinson, CEQA Project Manager from Rainey Planning and Management, Shane Roderack, uh, GE Senior Engineer from Geocon, and Brian Kearns, PhD wildlife biologist from WRA are present to help answer questions. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O'Connor. That's a, definitely a, a lot of work that's uh, gone into this since uh, last we uh, considered the matter. And, and we certainly had the benefit of a lot of uh, public input since then as well. So um, I'm going to ask first if uh, members of the commission have uh, questions or, or clarifications they'd like from Ms. O'Connor. Um, and Chair, before we move on from that, um, could we provide the commissioners an opportunity to disclose any ex parte communications they may have had uh, outside of the public hearing tonight? Thank you for uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, are there any commissioners who would like or who need to um, uh, sort of disclose any uh, ex parte communications they've had regarding this matter? Uh, Commissioner Berman. Yes, thank you. Um, I had one on one correspondence with a few community members. Uh, no other commissioners were present in this correspondence, and uh, my correspondence will not play a bias on tonight's meeting and deliberation. Thank you, Commissioner Berman. Uh, Commissioner Big Stick. Thank you, Chair. I had a conversation by phone with Christine Bowles and uh, wrote a few. She responded to a couple of her emails, a few of her emails. Um, and again, as Commissioner Berman stated, I don't think this uh, biases me in my judgment tonight, but that is the communication I have had with Ms. Bowles. Thank you, Commissioner Bigstick. Commissioner Godwin. Oh, I wanted to say I had a, a relatively brief telephone conversation with, with Summer Lee and discussed her concerns about the project. She's a neighbor, and I don't think this will bias me or affect my deliberation approach. Thank you, Commissioner Godwin. Commissioner Bigstick. I was just getting ready for um, questions to staff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it doesn't look like anybody else has any ex parte communications to report. Uh, so then we'll move on to, um, again, the question I was posing earlier, and that is whether or not anybody had any uh, questions or a request for clarification for uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. O'Connor. And it looks like, Commissioner Bigstick, you were first to the, uh, first to the draw there. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so my, my first question is an extraordinarily superficial question um, that's tangential by nature, but it was kind of brought up in community um, critique. So I, I just wanted to address it briefly. Um, and what they were saying essentially was because the um, parking spots at 504 Monterey Road uh, were currently not available, there has been more need for on-street parking. Um, as I went by the site, it looked like there were six parking spots if I was looking at the ones they were referring to. So my um, very superficial question is simply, who's responsible for those parking spots at 504 uh, Monterey Road? Um, so we, we heard that complaint. We, we took note of that in the public comments uh, and we passed that on to our code enforcement officer to investigate to see if there was um, any action that needed to be taken. Perfect. Thank you very much. And then um, my next question, 
I'm, it, it may or may not um, kind of slide into other questioning that might be more substantial. Just um, when I went by the site again today, it seemed like um, that strip of land right next to 513A where um, there's that that ditch there. It seemed like there were a lot more plants there the last time and somebody had chopped it down. So I, I had a chance to walk up to it and look at it a little closer and I could see where drainage might occur into um, that trough there. Um, so I was just wondering if you know what that drains into and it looked kind of blocked when I, I was looking at it. So I, I wasn't sure if it was blocked or um, what it drains into and who's responsible for the upkeep of that particular drain. Um, if you might have insight into that. If you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so I think I'll see if uh, senior engineer Don Guinness might know um, the, the drainage And it was on the property right next to 513A on the other side of that little wall there. Uh, yes, uh, so that, that water uh, currently is private water. Uh, so the, the storm drainage within the private property is the responsibility of the, uh, the private property. But however, as, as soon as it goes into the right of way, it's the city's responsibility to maintain the pipes within the right of way. Very much. So first of all, um, thank you to staff because um, I, you know, at a casual glance at this report, um, it's evident how much time and work and energy has been put into um, addressing a lot of the concerns of commission on the one hand and um, doing that much work, more work to flesh all this out. And, um, you know, what's not lost on me going into this proceeding tonight um, is how much work has gone into this. And then again, how much work has gone into this. So thank you, staff. Um, that having been said, um, the two concerns that were kind of uh, beaten upon me as I read as many um, community concerns as possible were the topics of water runoff and landslides. So I think my approach is just to kind of ask as many questions in as many ways as I can think to regarding water runoff and landslides. Um, the reason being, you know, first and foremost, I wanna make sure that if and when I have the ability to cast a yes vote on this, I am quite sure that everything is as safe as we can possibly make it. And on the other hand, to give um, the public watching this every opportunity to be given the impression if possible that this will be as safe as it could possibly be made. So um, maybe I'll just kind of start with a very general high level overview question and maybe you can get as specific as you can from that point. Um, but the concerns that I kept running across, which I think are very genuine concerns, are the run water runoff this, this project might create and any landslides that this project might create. So if you could address those two issues to get us started, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, um, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll probably separate them because it's gonna be two different engineers that will have to respond to that. Um, so starting with runoff, um, I will let uh, senior engineer Don Guinness um, and Mark Lander um, talk about the um, drainage calculations that they received from the applicant and the review that they performed um, to analyze the runoff. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, so I just want to go over what had Bonnie mentioned in the staff report. So basically, uh, the stormwater within the site is, uh, as she mentioned, it's going to be divided into two. Uh, the existing that's coming up the, from the hill. Uh, so that's going to be uh, going to be the same. Uh, the pipe is being extended uh, east, and the water coming off site. Uh, it's directly going to go into that storm drain pipe and go directly into the storm drain system. Uh, the second, the other side is the, the new development, the, the impervious, uh, the, the impervious services that's being created by the development. So those are the pavement, the driveway, the roofs. And again, as Ms. Uh, uh, O'Connor said, those will be treated through the C3 stormwater uh, system. 
Uh, basically, the applicant has uh, proposed a series of bioretention uh, planters and a detention basin to hold the excess or the, the difference in the flow, hold that on site until and uh, meter it slowly so that it's not creating a peak, uh, not adding to the peak flow uh, coming off the site and uh, contributing to uh, the city's storm drain system uh, down, downstream. Ray, can I um, ask you a question, stop you for just a brief moment and ask you a technical question? Um, those troughs that are supposed to hold the water, and I'm asking this question as somebody who does not have a technical background, so pardon the question uh, if it seems elementary, but those troughs, um, is there any concern whatsoever that um, they are not big enough that they could possibly hold the water that eventually they will be releasing? In other words, is there any concern that it's possible that um, those troughs could overflow if, say, a storm is big enough or something like that? We, uh, the applicant has based uh, the size on the, the San Mateo County uh, C3 requirements. And uh, I will turn it over to uh, Mark Lander, who's our peer reviewer. He can probably uh, explain it better than me. Okay, so there's, Commissioner, there's actually sort of three things going on. Uh, two things are required under the city's uh, stormwater permit through the state of California. One is that runoff be treated before it leaves the site. And the requirement is that generally uh, a fairly low amount of runoff, the, uh, the one year storm has to be treated. The remainder of the water can bypass the treatment. However, it has to be detained on site. And that's hydro modification. And the state permit requires that basically the water be held on the site, sort of the pre existing condition up to a 10 year storm. In this particular case, the, the um, applicant's consultant has run the Bay Area hydro modification model, the BAM model, which determines that detention uh, up to a 25 year storm. And the plans also show an additional, uh, the plans show two detention tanks, which are designed to handle the 25 year storm. There's an additional third tank uh, added in just above Monterey Road which should be adequate to handle the additional, the, uh, the 100 year storm total. I mean, well, that'll, that'll have to be verified during final design, but there should, and, and, and if not, there's, there's room on site to put in bigger storage tanks. Uh, the 100 year storm is typically the highest uh, storm, which is, is used in, uh, in drainage design. Because what occurred to me as I was listening to you was I think 2016 was when we had the really big storms and that triggers in my head, you know, all sorts of questions about climate change and the frequency with which, you know, 100 year storms become the new 25 year storm or even the new five years. So it, it just the brain starts going off in directions. And um, I'm glad that you addressed the 100 year storm model um, because that immediately was raised as a concern in my mind. Um, it sounds like that that uh, detail is being addressed, but is to staff, might it be necessary to put a condition of approval in that we want that large a tank um, for it to happen? Or is it certain that we're going to have a system in place that could handle a hundred year storm? And again, what predicates that question for me is um, just how many of these supposedly rare storms we've been seeing lately. Um, and so I just wanna be very thorough in my questioning. I think the condition of approval doesn't hurt. Uh, we do have a letter from the uh, design engineer indicating that he will design to the 100 year storm. I think we have, uh, I have the staff myself have uh, adequate notes to that effect in our files, but the condition of approval would be, would be a good idea. Okay, thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, Ray, did you have more that you wanted to say on the topic? Oh, no, I, that, that's, uh, Mark has covered it, I think. Uh, Commissioner Bixick, if, if I can help you get to your landslide uh, question. Um, so uh, as part of our CEQA review, we had um, Rainey and his, and their subconsultants review the geotechnical work performed by the applicant. Um, so 
uh, in terms of um, a peer review of the applicant's work, I will invite Shane Roderick to, um, to talk about his findings in his peer review of the geotechnical. Good evening, everyone. I did uh, have a chance to review uh, the applicant's uh, geotechnical reports for the project, as well as some other background reports that are applicable to this site. In our opinion, uh, the applicant's geotechnical study has adequately characterized the potential geotechnical and geological constraints for the, for the project, and the mitigation measures that are discussed in their reports seem reasonable for the identified constraints. Uh, I apologize if you could repeat that, the identified constraints, if you could. Sure. Um, there obviously slope stability is part of this project. It's a hillside. Um, the design level slope stability analysis will come forth during project design. That's pretty typical for development projects. Uh, the southern margin of the site has a has a, a natural drainage that uh, within the drainage and at points above the drainage, uh, landslide deposits exist. Uh, relatively shallow debris flows that tend to stay within that drainage. Uh, the mitigation measures, as I recall, that were identified by the applicant's geotechnical engineer were generally deflection and, um, in short, the natural topography of that area would harness debris flows to keep them away from the habitable structures and allow those flows to carry on through the site and uh, not threaten uh, life or safety. Okay. Um, what we're talking about... Uh debris flows, I'm going to ask because it came up quite a lot and again in uh, a lot of public emails. So I'm just trying to address things as thoroughly as I'm able to. Um, first of all, did we look at all, and by we I mean, you know, city staff, did you look at all um, at the, uh, the prior geotechnical review that took place apparently in 1991? Um, did that factor into your research and so, I, I, did, I did take a look at that, if the question was for me. Absolutely. Uh, whoever wants to take it, I'm, I'm new here, so I, I figure you all know it's, uh, who to answer. Um, so did, did you run across anything interesting that came out of looking at the 1991? Was it more or less in alignment with the recent um, analysis? There wasn't anything in there that was surprising to me. Um, the documents that I reviewed consisted of a geotechnical report by a company named John C. Home and Associates that I don't think exists anymore. And the review uh, documents, one, an initial review, secondarily a more thorough review, was performed by uh, Cotton and Associates, uh, more recently referenced as Cotton Shires and Associates, I believe. Um, they did provide you know, a, a set of comments on that report, things that needed to be addressed further. Uh, but apparently in looking at just the documents that were provided to me, uh, the project stopped at that point. Um, do you agree that those things still need to be looked at further or those um, elements that are uh, incorporated into the more recent review? I'm sorry, Commissioner Bixick, uh, I can't hear you and I'm not sure if others can either. I apologize for that. Yeah, I apologize for that. Um, uh, what I was saying was those elements that um, needed further analysis in the Cotton and Shires, I think you said reviewed. Did that look like um, things that have been addressed and do they need to be addressed further uh, or has the most recent reviews seem to have addressed those elements? I felt like the recent reviews and geotechnical report did touch on the items within the Cotton Shires uh, review that were still pertinent. There were aspects of that former project that uh, don't seem to have carried through to this one. Um, predominantly the use of keystone walls uh, throughout the site. Um, uh, what I've seen so far infers a, a different type of wall system will be used to develop the site. Do you have any reason to suspect that the keystone wall system is something that should be revisited or are you content that the uh, system currently being recommended should be sufficient? It doesn't seem to be something that's being proposed for this uh, current project, uh, particularly for the large wall in the hillside behind the townhomes, which would um, be most critical in my, in my view. 
um, would it be helpful to uh, look at that methodology? Is it so? You know, safety is what we're trying to get at at the end of the day. Um, is the Keystone Wall methodology um, an approach that should be studied for a moment before uh, this is cleared for liftoff? Frankly, I don't think it should be considered at all for the for the large wall behind the townhomes. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate given the the type of grading that would be necessary to build such a wall. Thank you very much. And so, uh, my last question for you, I think, is um, uh, well, I'll make it a two-parter. Um, do we know when the last landslide occurred, and do we have an idea how often landslides seem to occur? I don't have that information off the top of my head. Uh, there were a discussion of some relatively uh, recent debris flows in that uh, drainage on the southern end of the site. I think uh, everyone involved with the project understands that that could occur again within that drainage. Uh, but in my view, there's appropriate mitigation measures in place to deal with it should it occur. And my understanding so far is that those mitigation measures include um, the homeowners association signing off on um, that they need to, as an entity, do their due diligence to make sure that that's taken care of if and when it occurs. Because if they don't, there are going to be um, monetary ramifications for them if they do not take care of it when it occurs. Um, is that understanding more or less accurate or is there more that I should be seeing or am I just flat wrong? I wouldn't say you're flat wrong, but but I think the mitigation measure that's key here is is really the design of the site. Um, all the habitable structures have been kept away from that area. The grading of the site is such that if there were a debris flow in that area, it would come down the natural drainage, um, you know, essentially out the driveway if it was severe enough and miss any of the townhome structures themselves. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm good for now. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Big Stick. Uh, Commissioner Hauser. Thank you, Chair. I have uh, several uh, questions that fall into different categories. Um, so the first one was just a clarification on um, the MMRP. In fact, I have two MMRP uh, questions. So mitigation 4-4 um, is boarded in a way that the ephemeral ditch could be a wetland that would trigger a 404 action. Um, but it wasn't quite clear to me from how the um, condition was worded if the, uh, the jurisdictional delineation was meant to cover the entire site or just the area with the ephemeral ditch. So are we surveying the entire site for wetlands? Um, or if you could get some clarity on that. Uh, so I can provide an initial response, and um, Brian Kearns, the, the wildlife biologist, can fill in if I miss anything. Um, so WRA um, did a reconnaissance level uh, survey of the site, and in that they found the areas um, of where um, of vegetation community that may represent a wetland. Um, so the mitigation measure would be focused on just that drainage area uh, where they identified a, a potential jurisdictional wetland would occur um, and not the entire site. To be clear, even though a formal delineation wasn't conducted, a reconnaissance level survey indicated that the only place that the biology experts thought that there could be wetlands was the ephemeral ditch. Is that summarizing that correctly? I believe so, but I will allow uh, Brian Kearns to confirm that for you. Thank you, Ms. O'Connor. Hello, Commissioners. Um, yeah, that's correct. Uh, yeah, Bonnie summarized it really nicely. The reconnaissance level survey, um, we give a general view of the whole site and identify areas where there could be wetlands using vegetation as our main indicator, but also presence of water. Um, and occasionally we can use soils as well to um, kind of give us a sense. Um, the formal delineation kind of builds on that and uh, makes everything uh, even more specific so we can really hone in on areas that can be considered um, well. And so it's, it sort of can be considered an additional level of detail. Um, so when we do these reconnaissance level site visits, it takes into account the whole site. Um, the recommendation for the formal delineation indeed focuses it down, uh, in this case, to the ephemeral range. 
specifically, yeah. So did, um, did WRA, it sounds like you looked at plans clearly, did you look at um, the, I can't remember if it's like hydric soils or whatever the terminology is, but did you look at soils? I mean, my, my understanding is it's a two out of three indicate that there's a potential wetland, right? So did you look at two out of three categories? Uh, you know, that's a that's a good question. I, I conducted the wildlife portion of the site visit. I'm not specifically sure what our wetland person did, um, but typically these types of assessments, yeah, address, you know, when, when he was looking at those uh, indicators, he would have addressed two out of three, like you're saying. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so okay. that's, yeah, by themselves typically in most areas aren't sufficient to define a wetland. Um, so in this case, um, you know, the fact that, you know, that, that there may have been some soils or, or other indicators as well, um, would have been enough to key him in on that point. Right. Um, so then my my next part of this question is definitely more for you. <laughs> so it sounds like the ephemeral ditch could be a wetland, but again, this formal delineation hasn't been done yet. But the the response to comment letter that um, that Rainey and staff and WRA put together um, mentioned that there are several protected species that. Um, are not projected to occur on site on site because they typically prefer wetland and marsh habitats. Um, but I guess where I'm I'm missing the you know where I'm not getting the continuity is if the MND states that the wetland delineation hasn't happened yet but would be required prior to construction. How are we making an assessment that those that those protected species aren't on site? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I'm happy to address that. It's, um, I mean, basically the the simple answer is that not all wetlands are created equal. Um, so specifically, I think um, I've seen in some of the comments, um, common yellow throat and red-legged frog is two that have come up sort of specifically. Um, I'll start common yellow throat um, is, a, is a California uh, protected species under CEQA um, specifically. And that species, um, it's, it's a widespread species, but the protected species is a subspecies that lives in the Bay Area specifically. Um, and in our experience in widespread surveys, these, this species lives pretty specifically in um, more marsh type areas. So salt marsh, kind of coastal areas, flat, um, inundated with water most of the time. Um, that's where they breed. Um, and this is an important distinction as well. Uh, the habitat that we really need to consider under CEQA is the breeding habitat. Um, so there, there's that distinction in the BRA and in the MND as well, um, that, uh, you know, although a species may forage on a site or move through a site, uh, that doesn't necessarily indicate um, the need for, for mitigation. Um, those violations under Fish and Game Code or Migratory Bird Treaty Act would be um, specific to destruction of nesting, uh, which is what we discuss uh, in our in our impacts to mitigation. Um, so that we stand by the claim that the, the common yellow throat, although it could forage on the site occasionally, uh, is unlikely to nest there uh, because it doesn't, the habitat that's there, although it could be considered a wetland, potentially pending results of a delineation, uh, doesn't match up with where we believe that species exists um, after you know, quite a lot of evidence through other surveys. Uh, Red-legged frog, um, I think the main thing here, um, again, they do use wetland habitat, but that habitat has to be inundated for extended periods of time for them to complete um, their development process. Uh, 20 weeks and um, is like sort of the, the going number for red-legged frog. And uh, we don't have any reason to believe that that ephemeral drainage ditch would be inundated for a sufficient period to, uh, to support that kind of development or to support any kind of source population. Uh, for the species. So those are sort of the, the foundational bases of our of our conclusions for those two species. Have there been red-legged frogs, because it's specific, so <laughs> have there been red-legged frogs found within, you know, like a quarter mile of the site or some sort of close radius? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. I asked if red-legged frogs have been found within a close proximity to the site or how what the closest sighting has been. I believe there's um, documented occurrences. We assess um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife's um, locational database, mainly um, natural uh, CNDDB, so um, what it is. Uh, I believe there's an occurrence within approximately a mile of the site, which is actually a bit outside of how far we typically see these frogs disperse. Um, it's also the case that the habitat matrix around this vicinity is generally pretty broken up already by um, 
development and roadways and those sorts of things. And we typically consider those to be barriers to dispersal, um, specific, especially for species that are smaller and, and you know, unable to leave the ground like, like birds would be. Um, it's also uh, the case that, you know, because there's no aquatic habitat on site that the impetus for, um, you know, these sort of like CRLF, uh, red-legged frog specifically, uh, to move to the site uh, isn't, isn't really there. Um, there's, we don't believe the habitat there is, is uh, attractive to them um, for upland or aquatic purposes. And, um, and yeah, they're, therefore they're unlikely to move through the site even you know, much less use it for, for any you know, critical portion of their, of their life. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I was wondering if, um, if staff could maybe elaborate a little bit on how this uh, project meets the hillside ordinance in our municipal code. I saw several public comment letters that were asking that question and I think it would be helpful if staff could elaborate on that. Are you referring to the uh, a hillside preservation ordinance or are you, or are in you- In particular, I believe there was a table in the municipal code that referred to a minimum lot size of two acres for a subdivision that's over 50% slope. And then I think it was 1.2 or something like for 35% slope. And I also didn't know what the overall slope of the site was. So that was one of my questions, but that might be a question for the applicant. Yeah. Um, this the site is a a, a, a little over fifty one percent has a average of a little over fifty one percent slope. Um, and in regards to your question, um, I believe what you're referring to is a, a subdivision standard in our subdivision ordinance um, or regulations. Um, it it's a section of our code that establishes um, grading and lot size standards for hillside um, subdivisions. Um, staff, current staff does not believe that this standard applies to the project because this project is a subdivision for condominium purposes, which is different from a standard subdivision um, in that it's subdividing um, land I mean, I'm sorry, uh, the condominium subdivision is subdividing airspace into um, individual interests rather than subdividing land as a, as a traditional subdivision is. And so uh, the, the land is not being affected by the subdivision and uh, therefore it doesn't, it's not appropriate. Staff does not believe that it's appropriate to apply this standard that um, is not affected by um, the condominium subdivision action. Um, there are other regulations in our code that do address um, development standards for um, these types of projects. Um, and if this was a subdivision of land um, where roads were being created or uh, separate lots were being created, then um, staff would find it appropriate then to apply those standards. And thank you, Bonnie. Good evening, Commission Senior Planner Christian Murdoch. Um, we do uh, describe this point in greater detail in the staff report, uh, starting on packet page 86. And I want to clarify, it's not simply staff's opinion. Uh, we thoughtfully considered this point. We evaluated the municipal code, the definitions in the municipal code, as well as state law. Uh, reading all of those together as described in the staff report uh, provides a sound basis for concluding that these lot size and grading standards are not applicable to this condominium subdivision, whereas other standards in Title 10 are generally applicable to all subdivisions. Uh, this lot size and grading standard table uh, is clearly limited to um, lots, which are defined in the municipal code as land. And so there's a, a key distinction here factually uh, additionally, um, support is provided in the Subdivision Map Act, which is the state law governing subdivisions, and where it discusses condominium subdivisions, it articulates, again, in plain language that standards such as lot size are limited to um, subdivisions of land uh, and are not um, to be applied to condominium subdivisions. And so we think there's a sound basis uh, in law and, in fact, not simply staff opinion and uh, analysis of this point. 
uh, to support our conclusion on the matter. Thank you. I'm, Commissioner Hauser, I'm going to take the liberty of asking uh, Ms. Sharma if she has anything she wants to add to this from the perspective of the uh, city attorney's office. I agree with Senior Planner Murdoch's uh, assessment and analysis in the staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hauser. Thank you. That answers um, my question very well. Um, I just have three more. Uh, so one of the things we talked about a lot during the last hearing was um, doing a full sidewalk replacement, and I know the applicant had agreed to do that. So I wanted to understand kind of how we arrived at a conclusion of a partial sidewalk replacement. I'm sorry, I, I didn't capture that question clearly. Do you mind repeating it? No problem. Um, so at the last hearing, one of the, the items that we spent a lot of time on was um, whether or not there would be a full sidewalk replacement. Um, and the drawings and the staff report both acknowledged that um, there's a portion of existing sidewalk that would be maintained and then a small portion of um, sidewalk replacement. And so I was wondering how, um, especially since the applicant had agreed to provide a sidewalk replacement in the last meeting, I was wondering how we came to the conclusion, how staff came to the conclusion um, that that requirement would not be something that we looked at or, or that we were going to propose on this at this meeting. Um, I believe it was determined that there wasn't a, a nexus for a full uh, sidewalk replacement. Um, the applicant has um, offered or proposed to replace portions of the existing sidewalk that are in poor condition or that are damaged. Um, but there's not a nexus to have the city require more than, than that. Um, all right, the, um, I appreciate that there was an inclusion of a soft skate plan this time around. Um, I know that I had asked for that at the last hearing. Um, I would note that the planting plan and the planting shown on the renderings are very distinct. They don't match. And so I'm wondering which document we should be looking at, which one is the, the document that we would be approving tonight if this project moves forward. So you would be um, approving a preliminary uh, planting plan as shown in the plan set. Um, a condition of approval would require that a final landscaping plan be prepared. Um, so it would at least meet the minimums, um, like the, the, re the replacement plantings and the, the species um, as proposed um, and based on the ability to find um, a nexus for requiring certain size plants and tree replacements, um, you would see that added within the, the final landscaping plan. Um, okay, and then my last question is um, section five of the staff report is about Housing Accountability Act compliance. Um, and it just it talks about um, a couple of findings um, that would uh, potentially need to be made or not made um, regarding the project. And I would just wanted staff to elaborate on, on that. And I wasn't quite sure what the link to the, to the project was. So if you could clarify that, that would be great. Yeah, Bonnie, I'm happy to answer this one, uh, at least initially. So uh, the purpose of that analysis in Section 5 uh, relates to the fact that this uh, project site is located within the housing site inventory of the city's adopted housing element. And by including this site in that uh, housing site inventory, there are special legal requirements applicable to review of projects uh, on the site for the city. Among those uh, various uh, legal requirements um, is the issue of whether a project is proposed at a density below what was indicated uh, as assumed in the housing element inventory. Uh, what was assumed for this site based on its size and general plan density was nine dwelling units. The applicant proposed the project at eight dwelling units, which is one dwelling unit less than the housing inventory table. And as a result, the city ne needed to make findings uh, should this project be approved that 
we would still have sufficient sites elsewhere in the city to comply with our regional housing needs allocation or RENA. Uh, the thought being that the state did not want projects uh, proposed at less density than had been assumed and therefore the city would not ultimately be able to achieve um, the number of developed units necessary for the arena across the various income categories. And so we've uh, conducted that analysis and concluded that the project as proposed by the applicant with eight dwelling units uh, would not uh, cause a problem for availability of sufficient sites in the city's housing element. And Myself again. And that in big part is because it's still within the, because there's enough inventory and then also because the project is proposing a density that's still within the range allowed by the general plan. Right. So, uh, you know, a preliminary matter is ensuring that the project is consistent with the general plan land use designation, which has a range of allowable density. Um, so the project checks that box. The next test uh, for general plan and um, Housing Accountability Act compliance is to ensure that the project, um, if it proposes fewer units than assumed in the housing inventory, that it uh, would not adversely impact availability of sufficient sites to meet the city's housing needs across uh, the range of income level. Thank you, Commissioner Hauser. Was any other questions or was that it for the moment? Uh, Commissioner Ferguson. Uh, Ms. O'Connor and staff, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for all your work. You guys have put a lot of effort into this. Um, apologies in advance. This is my second meeting and first time speaking. So if I am off on any of the decorum here, you'll have to bear with me. I'm still learning. Uh, I have a series of questions uh, for a series of different people. The first question I've got, I'd like to direct to Mr. Lander. Um, you discussed the uh, site would have to be required to treat the stormwater. I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on this process. How are they treating it? How long are they holding it? Um, and you know, the methods, and then at which point do they release this into the general aquifers? Okay, so the state's, you know, the state's uh, stormwater permit requires that stormwater leaving a newly developed site be treated so that pollutants uh, oil, metals, and so forth are filtered out of the water before it's discharged into the in the storm drain, then ultimately into the ocean. And so the required design treatment is the uh, one-year storm. Uh, the thought being that majority of the water comes off during uh, about 80, 90 percent of the rainfall that we see throughout the year comes in, off during low flow storms, and that's where you pick up the the oil and so forth that's accumulated between storms. Uh, higher flows do not need to be treated. However, they do need to be detained. And so in this case, the, the driveway runoff is being directed into a holding tank, which will then meter the flow out at the, at the one year storm rate into a, uh, a, a treatment uh, detention cell. Basically, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a flow through planter. It's think of a concrete bathtub full of gravel and a, and a, uh, and a uh, planting mix. Uh, the bathtub can be planted. Water flows in through the top of the mix. It filters on down through the mix, then down to the gravel, goes out through a subdrain, and then can be, and then it's discharged in the city storm drain system. That water is treated, it's not detained. The water that's being detained, is, the detention is being provided by the holding tank. For the, uh, for the rooftop, the rooftop drainage, it's, it's sort of the reverse, where the rooftop drainage is directed into a planter and the, the, the planting mix can only absorb so much water. It's designed to take the one year storm. So at that point, once you get into a higher storm through the 10 year storm, the water then starts to back up and there is a, an overflow outlet built into the planter, which allows the water then drain on out. Uh, that runoff is going to be uh, treated in one of two downstream, uh, I'm sorry, not treated, stored in one of two downstream detention tanks before being, and then water will be metered out of those two detention tanks before being discharged into the storm drain system in Monterey Road. Does, that's a long answer. Does that help though? Uh, a little. Can I ask a couple of follow-ups to you? You described the metering of the one year, or sorry, treating of the one year storms. Uh, are we just talking about it's going to flow through a drain and a garden and a bioretention basin and as it passes through the soils and the gravel, that's the treatment? That's exactly, that's the treatment. Okay. Uh, 
And then you discuss the retention and metering of the five-year larger storms. Uh, do they have a schedule for, so if you get a hundred year storm and they say they have to hold this, at what time frame do they have to hold it? At what, uh, at what point do they get to release it? How is it metered and who determines this? It will be metered out so that it's at no greater than the pre-existing uh, rate off the site, the 10 year storm. The hydro modification also required by the state permit requires that water runoff be metered so that up to the 10 year storm, it's not leaving the site at a rate higher than the water would have previously left the site in an undeveloped condition. In this particular case, uh, JC Engineering has provided uh, calculations that take us all the way up to the 25 year storm. And then there's a third tank, which has not, not, not been sized yet, but it's shown on the plans and that should be adequate to take the 100 year storm. And so that water, it's, it's, it, 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 it's held in the sense that there's, well, okay, it's held, the tank is sized so that over the duration of a storm, um, and, and it's probably the 24 hour storm, um, the difference in uh, the, the volume of water that comes off pre-construction uh, compared to the volume of water that comes off post-construction is held within that tank. And so after the storm, water stop, you know, water no longer is coming in, the tank will then drain on out, again, at a flow, metered at a flow rate to where it can never be greater than what the flow rate was before, uh, before the development occurred. Yeah, I understand the process. I think maybe my question wasn't clear. Um, you say metered, are we talking about a valve that's operable that somebody is physically controlling the flow out? Is there a pro programmable logic controller that's controlling how this water comes out? Oh, I, 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 okay, I'm sorry. Uh, no, there's, a, uh, there's an orifice or a weir built into the tank and the, or, uh, the orifice is designed sized so that the water cannot leave through that orifice uh, above a certain uh, design rate. And the design rate would be the pre-construction flow. So there's no, um, no one has to go out and turn on a valve, um, push a button, um, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a passive uh, system. It does have to be maintained and cleaned down on occasion, but it doesn't require someone to go out and actually operate it. Did that answer the question? That answers my question. Um, it's, I've got a, Similar related follow-up question. I don't know if it's to you or maybe to Ms. O'Connor, uh, which has to do with during the construction process, um, has there been any uh, thought to a restriction um, imposing that this, uh, the grading, the retaining wall construction, the construction of the bioretention basins and the drainage system uh, be restricted to only dry weather seasons? It seems to me that a, a a responsible stormwater pollution prevention plan would be really challenging given the grade and the scope of the excavation that I have seen from this project. Yeah, uh, happy to address that question for you, Commissioner Ferguson. Um, so we do have a municipal code provision addressing issuance of grading permits. Uh, so in the instance where uh, grading would be proposed separate from the building permit process, um, we do have a limitation on dry weather grading um, to restrict the grading to only those times of year outside of the, the wet season or the rainy season. However, uh, upon, uh, upon providing a sufficient um, stormwater uh, BMP or best management practices um, plan for um, erosion control on the site, the building official can authorize grading during the rainy season. Um, I think certainly the uh, hillside condition of this very steep site would probably factor into that determination as to whether um, the erosion control methods are adequate. Uh, but I, I can't speak for what the building officials determination would be and whether uh, sufficient BMPs could put in place. Uh, but it is possible to grade in the rainy season, although the presumption is that it will not occur during the rainy season. Um, otherwise, if grading were to occur as part of the building permit process, uh, a stormwater control plan would be necessary. Uh, and again, uh, it would need to demonstrate to the building official satisfaction that it could control the erosion. Um, and Ms. O'Connor, uh, could you maybe address whether there's a mitigation measure as well that might address grading? Uh, I'm not aware, I'm not sure if there is on this project. Um. <clears throat>
we can check and confirm for you, Commissioner Ferguson. Uh, it's it's common, but not you know always the case where there's a mitigation measure for CEQA purposes as well that control um, the timing of grading, either for um, water quality reasons or um, for other reasons. Potentially. Yeah, I guess there's a bit more to my question than just the grading itself. Uh, the grading, although it's substantial, once you've opened up that cut and then you've got uh, time to build in all of your all of the retention bases they discussed earlier. Um, these things don't happen overnight, I imagine. I don't have any idea what how they plan to construct or the crew size they're planning or the time of year, but um, I'm worried that there could be a scenario in which the walls are up and the dirt has been removed and now you've got a different soils condition exposed to a winter environment and it, the grading could have been done months earlier but you've got a site that's not prepared to handle the storm and then you have a different runoff condition. Of course, I think that's the exact scenario that the city's um, grading ordinance is intended to control or to try to prevent uh, by ensuring that there's appropriate uh, erosion control measures in place or else preventing the grading as part of a grading permit. Uh, perhaps one of the other uh, members of the team, one of the engineers could speak more to what those measures are and their efficacy during, you know, high flow winter weather events. I've got an additional question I can tack onto that since we're going to put it to the engineers. Um, the thing that jumped out to me the most, uh, and maybe it's Mr. Rodiker who addresses this. I'm not. I'm not sure who the all the players are yet, but um, by the information I read, um, I believe they allude to a maximum height of any retaining wall in the back of the building to be five feet. Uh, maybe the applicant could confirm that. Um, the plans seem to show a very tight series of walls tiered one above another. Um, I was hoping somebody could give me an idea. Uh, one of the total grade change between the drive aisle behind the units um, and two, uh, if this has been looked at and the construction seems like this is a feasible, adequate, and best practices way to um, change this grade for this type of a slope uh, that close behind uh, sort of a densely populated new division. I think it may take a moment, Commissioner Ferguson, to get that um, technical information on the, the grades at the site. Um, is there anyone on the team that wants to take the uh, you know, project concept uh, part of Commissioner Ferguson's question? It, it may be a question most appropriate for the applicant to describe the thought process uh, that went into designing the project. And then um, maybe once we have that, uh, then we could have the geotechnical Peer reviewer, uh, Mr. Rodiker, um, addressed the, the points as to uh, his considerations of the peer review. And the, the project applicant would uh, be appropriate to respond once the chair advances us to that phase of the hearing, not right now necessarily. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, put a tack in that question. Is that the, uh, is that the proposal? I think it is. I think there's a, really a question that's appropriate for the applicant, but we're not yet at the uh, applicant presentation or, or question and answer phase, Chair. Okay, that sounds good. Well, why don't we go ahead and hold, uh, hold that. Um, Commissioner Ferguson, do you have other questions? No, nope, I'll yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Godwin. Yeah, I've got a few questions about drainage as well. I guess the first one, is there any annual inspection of the completed system contemplated by the city or offered by the applicant that you're aware of? I didn't see it in the documents, but it may have been there. Um, so we have added a condition of approval to require um, the HOA as part of their CCNRs to submit a annual annual proof of maintenance of their catch basins and pipes um, to make sure that they're in working order uh, prior to each rainy season. That would be my needs. Um, my next question is, I noticed the water table level was about 11 feet. 
that doesn't seem unusually unusual for Pacifica. My recollection is a number of the houses have half that. Are you concerned about the water table on this site, given the slope of the hill? Um, I will invite uh, Shane Rodacker to um, provide his uh, thoughts on the water table. Can someone repeat the question? I stepped away for a restroom break. Um, I noticed in some of the documentation, the water table on this site was um, 11 feet. And I know in Pacifica, there's a lot of places where the water table's half that. Do you um, see this as a problem given the steepness of the site? Uh, Localized seepage will be something that needs to be dealt with in design, that's for sure, uh, particularly with the drainage system for the large retaining wall behind the townhomes. The 11 foot groundwater measurement came from borings that were performed on the fringes of the site. And in my opinion, those aren't really representative of uh, the bedrock cut that is going to be performed for the bulk of the site. Okay. And my last question is an old water skier. There's been a, a lot of lakes that um, just put out on a website what their depths were dynamically on a day-by-day -day basis. Are there some simple sensors, flow meters, um, and something to report the status of the of the reten retention basing, how full how full they are that you could put in maybe pipe out to a site at the city or something uh, that could be cheaply maintained that because a number of the of the neighbors have indicated that they were concerned about the maintenance of the drainage system and debris clogging and whatnot if there was some simple information we could give to them at, at each storm i think that would mitigate a lot of the concern are you do you think that's a wise approach or or not Commissioner Godwin, I think you're asking me something that's better answered from a civil design perspective, um, if I heard the question correctly. Okay. Um, should I hold this question for the applicant or? Unless there's somebody on the team here who can, from a civil design perspective, can address it. Senior Engineer Dinginis or uh, Mr. Lander, do either of you have an opinion as to uh, perhaps other communities that may monitor the stormwater uh, detention system and what the options could be for that? Uh, generally, I, I haven't seen monitoring required for a, a private system this small. I mean, you might see it for a large say, a, a dam, a larger flood control system. Uh, for a system this small, I've never seen it applied. I would imagine there is probably some technology out there which, uh, which could do what, uh, uh, Commissioner Godwin is suggesting, but I have not seen that apply to something of a small in the past. Okay, that's the last of my questions. Great. Um, it looks like all the um, questions and you know sort of requests for clarification from members of the commission at this point. So I think what we'll do then is move to the um, public hearing uh, segment of this of this item, and we'll. Uh, ask the applicant uh, for uh, any presentation or information the applicant wants to share. We will uh, afford 10 minutes if the applicant wants to uh, reserve a portion of that 10 minutes to respond to any questions or comments that we may get from um, the public generally. The applicant, of course, can do that as well. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, I'm Javier Chavarria with JC Engineering. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, we can. Perfect. Please continue. Yes, with JC Engineering. Uh, I'm here to summarize what we've done to improve our project uh, following the direction that we received from you at the previous meeting. Um, I think staff has done a very good job in summarizing what we've done. But I'm just going to make emphasis in a few of the points to make sure that uh, we are very clear of what we're doing. First, you requested for a high-level garbage, garbage management plan. We redesigned the front of the 
site so that every building has direct access to the sidewalk without any steps so they can easily pull the garbage bins and we designated areas behind the sidewalk where they can be placed and be at the same time very accessible to the garbage collection people. You also ask for a turnaround for the parking, for the guest parking. So we analyzed the site, the site and relocated the parking that we had before as parallel parking and put it as perpendicular parking so that it would function better, it will be more visible from the street and will allow for the location of, the, of a three-point turnaround at the end of the property. You also ask for more information on how to minimize the mass of the building and mitigate the tall appearance of the buildings. So we consulted with uh, other landscape architects and they recommended the use of the oak trees that we're proposing. Um, they're good for the area. They grow uh, nicely. They can easily be maintained and shaped in such a manner that they uh, you know, look like something that belongs on the site and that helps to minimize that mass as seen from the street. You also ask uh, to work more detail on the drainage system. And we did. We went much further than is normally required at this level of conceptual approval. We actually did formal calculations for the sizing of the flow through planters. Uh, we prepare a much more comprehensive drainage plan so that all the waters are very clearly shown how they're flowing through so that the uh, plan checkers and peer reviewers uh, can understand our concept. We are confident that we can achieve uh, proper drainage of the site, control drainage that would actually be improving the conditions that currently exist. The existing drainage on the swell area normally gets clogged. It is not correctly maintained. Um, that drainage collects a lot of water that comes from the adjacent buildings. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, there is no maintenance plan that the, that the adjacent buildings have to maintain this area. So what we will be doing is improving the conditions with our drainage. Uh, you also ask us to consider uh, the construction of a sound wall uh, for the benefit of the adjacent neighbor. We contacted the neighbor, we had a meeting on site, and he expressed no interest on the, the construction of a sound wall. And then uh, what is the HOA going to do to make sure that the project functions correctly? Well, the CCNRs are going to be prepared in such a manner that it gives proper direction to the association on how to maintain the drainage, how to maintain the site, and uh, the budget of the association will include, a, as part of their yearly plan, a, a funds uh, for those specific purposes. In addition to those items that the commission asked, we also uh, enhance our plan by implementing already a lot of the recommendations that the soils report had. We normally include those on the engineering plans and at the building permit set. But at this time, uh, because of the concerns that you express, we added the catchment walls that are intended to protect uh, the site from any possible debris coming from that uh, questioned area. So the catchment wall and the design of the site is, is done in a tier manner in case that some disastrous uh, condition occurs at the gully area, the catchment walls will contain some of that movement. And if it's not contained, it, it will be able to come and store in those tier sections of the back of the buildings. Uh, through the public comments, uh, there has been some I would say insulting and bad comments attacking my capacity and my integrity as professional. I'm not going to entertain those comments. Um, I know that we're doing the best that we can. We are trying to be as transparent as possible. And uh, if you have already touched on one of the items that is being uh, mentioned and it's a, an older soils report that was done in the early 90s. We were not by any means trying to hide any information from that report, but the current soils report that we have confirms the findings of that report. That report done in the 90s did 12 borings. 10 out of the 12 borings show bedrock within four feet of, of the surface. Two of them show bedrock much deeper at 11, 7 to 11 feet, and that is the area where the debris flow occur. So 
following the, the, the best engineering criteria, we moved the homes out of that section. We put them all in the area where the bedrock is sound and stable. So we have done exactly what the Cotton Shires did on their peer review. They said, eliminate keystone walls. So now we're using tieback walls and peer support the retaining walls. So we are using much better principles of engineering and drainage to ensure that the project is safe, that the project is sound, and that we are uh, taking care um, of the public safety and then, of course, um, the suitability of the project for the area. We have taken every step that is possible at this stage of conceptual design to make sure that our project will be feasible at the time of the formal design. Uh, some of the questions uh, that you had probably will answer later on. Um, uh, John Contrabecki, the project sponsor also had a few comments to make. Um, later on, I'll be available for any questions that you may have uh, on the technical aspects. Our soils engineer, Mr. Dan Dykeman, is also available uh, to answer any questions you may have. So, John, if you may use your minutes left. John, are you still there? Uh, Mr. Contrabecki, did you want to say a few words at this time? Hang on. Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. I want to make a few uh, comments about the project review process. Uh, when I introduced myself to the commission at the last uh, meeting, I shared with you that, that I had a great deal of experience developing property in the Bay Area, and I've developed in San Mateo County, Santa Clara, Alameda, and also in Europe. And every real estate project goes through two kinds of governmental review. There's what it's called conceptual review. And then the second review is called technical review. Um, now, these two review processes are designed to answer two different questions. The first question is, what is being proposed? And the second question is, how do you build it? Now, we're in this project is in the conceptual, conceptual review process. It was triggered by uh, uh, our project application. And the scope of review uh, is to determine whether the project conforms uh, to the general planning and zoning ordinance for the city of Pacifica. There is also an environmental review that has to conform to the requirements of CEQA, and the commission has the authority to conduct an aesthetic review as well. And it's within the authority of the planning commission to approve or disapprove the project. Now, the technical review is triggered by a building permit application and the scope of review is based upon uh, a review of the technical documents proposed by the owner to actually build the project. The review is conducted by the building department with the assistance of outside consultants. And the, the standard is the uh, City of Pacifica Building Code. And the uh, building department has the authority to issue the building permit, provided, of course, it complies with law. This is, this is textbook for the commissioners, but it's probably not clear to the members of the public who are uh, participating in the uh, event this evening. Now, Christine and Robert Bowles are architects and they're uh, residents of the city of Pacifica, and they're opposing this project. Uh, when I review the, uh, the uh, package that was prepared by the planning staff, the bulk of the communication in the package is coming from the Bowles. And what I notice is that they're conflating conceptual review with technical review and they appear to be trying to turn building permit questions into CEQA issues. And this is muddying the conceptual review process. Now, the Bulls appear to have um, little experience in processing projects for conceptual review, and they are disrupting the process and wasting staff time with excessive correspondence and demands for meetings to advocate points that are outside the scope of conceptual review. The planning package has over 1,000 pages of documents. I've never seen anything like this for a project of this size. Mr. Kondrabeck, you have 30 seconds left. Okay, well, the Bulls can raise their technical questions during the technical review. Uh, their uh, attack on this project has been highly irregular, and I ask the, commissions to con uh, the commissioners to consider this. 
The second point I, I want to make is that their correspondence is littered with uh, comments that question the competency of Mr. Shavaria and the planning staff and uh, question my character and the character of Mr. Shavaria. Uh, personal attacks on sponsors and staff are, are unprofessional and they have no place in this process. And I hope the commissioners uh, bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kondrabecki. Okay, well, that's the uh, that's the, the time that's allocated to the applicant to, in, in the process. So we'll go ahead then and move to um, general public comment. And uh, I guess we'll, we'll see if we've got, uh, <laughs> well, if we've got, I'm sure we do, have um, comment uh, from the public. And uh, uh, each uh, each speaker will have three minutes to, uh, to speak, uh, recognizing again that we received a lot of comment, I will note, uh, you know, with the uh, first um, consideration of this matter. And uh, so a lot of those comments we've already heard and we've got, um, we've got those matters uh, under advisement. But uh, in any event, with that said, we'll go ahead then. And uh, Mr. Murdoch, could you uh, let us know, uh, you know, who's, uh, uh, who's uh, queued up for, uh, for comment? Yes, Chair, I'm just setting up my screen to uh, run the timer for the public, and uh, then I'll uh, identify the speakers for you. Uh, the first speaker we have is Madhu Matthew. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the last name again? Matthew, Madhu Matthew. Uh, great. Um Madhu Matthew, if you could go ahead, please, and, uh, and, and begin your comment. Mr. Matthew, please go ahead. Yep, thank you for the time. Uh, my name is Madhu Matthew, and I live on Monterey Road, very close to the proposed Vistamar project. Um, since the last public hearing, you know, we've witnessed some really terrible chain of events. Um, unprecedented number of wildfires, severe habitat loss, unbreathable air, dark orange skies in the middle of the day. Now, these are supposed to be extreme once in a life events, but with runaway climate change, these are becoming everyday or common occurrences, just like um, Commissioner Big Stick uh, mentioned earlier. Now, as city planners and commissioners, you're kind of like the, the caretakers of the city. Um, you know, my humble request to you today is not to operate in a business as usual manner. Um, we all need to consider cons conservation and sustainability more seriously. You know, uh, city of Half Moon Bay is set to adopt a land use plan that attempts to better balance utilization and conservation. So that's my, you know, humble appeal to, the, uh, to you today. The Vistamar project as it's currently proposed is clearly designed to maximize height and maximize the ocean views to sell these as premium priced units. You know, simply make the most um, most profit, dig up the entire hillside in the process. You know, commissioners, you mentioned affordable housing stock as an important issue for your last hearing, but even with one MBR unit, building high priced units does not really address affordable housing stock in the medium or short term horizon. It actually contributes to community displacement effect because of inflationary price pressures. So common people like teachers, nurses, uh, first responders, they all continue to face that price pressure and they're kind of forced to move farther away for jobs to uh, afford comparable housing. So we have a project that has got a lot of negative environmental effects, severe erosion risk, land risk, and unfortunately, in my opinion, no real societal benefit. You know, uh, and the other thing is if you do a simple search, um, on Mr. Contrabecki, there's a long history of bankruptcy in related court proceedings. So this is another aspect of risk that I'm very worried about. So back to my you know, a point about cost benefit and risk analysis in this day of worrying climate change, the project should at minimum consider going through the proper EIR due diligence. As a group of concerned neighbors, we have tried to raise uh, higher outside experts to highlight these issues. And an EIR can actually explore alternate sustainable build options that truly benefit the neighborhood and not scar it permanently like the Harmony One project did. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matthew. Um, who is our next speaker? Next, we have Robert Bowles. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Bull. Why don't you go ahead? Hi, this is Robert Bowles. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I want to compliment the um, planning commissioners on their wonderful questions and on, on listening to us. Um, the comment was made that myself and my wife are driving the criticism of this project. It really isn't just us. There's several dozen community members that are very upset by this project. Um, we may have done most of the writing, but it's certainly not us all, all by ourselves. Um, Mr. Kotcher, Becky made the point that this is a conceptual review and that there will be a later technical review. Well, the technical review is done by the billing department and by outside plan checkers. We don't get to say in that. We don't get to see that. We don't get to comment on it. We have no way to question the technical viability of the project later on. This is our one chance to um, to make comment on what we feel is a, is a really terrible design. Um, I wanted to talk about the geotechnical aspects of the project mostly. We've been complaining for nine months that the project's geotechnical report had only two shallow borings, neither in areas where the buildings or major excavations were to be made. Um, these earlier soils reports that you just heard about this evening uh, had never been um, brought to public light. Um, it was sleuthing by our neighborhood group that, that brought them to light. Um, you would never have heard about them otherwise. Um, the current project civil engineer was involved in the earlier project also, and he knew about them. Um, so it's a mystery to us why he has withheld this information and also a mystery as to why the staff in their research of the project records uh, never made comment on them, never brought them to light. Um, it's actually not a mystery, it's outrageous. It's completely outrageous. So now here we are at the 11th hour and they've finally been brought to light. Well, as noticed, noted, notified earlier today, those earlier reports found four landslides on the site. Our other research has found 10 landslides in the near vicinity on the very same greenstone hillsides the project cannot be considered safe without further investigative study of the geotechnical aspects. There's evidence of natural seepage, landslides, debris flow. It is not a safe site. There are grave concerns about the water table pushing against the retaining walls of the project and further adding to water within the um, product project retention systems that have not been addressed by the current design. Um, given all this, can you truly in good conscience make the necessary findings for a use permit that this is a safe site for the public? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. Uh, who's our next speaker? Next we have Gail Schumacher. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. So my name is Gail Benton Shoemaker. I'm part of a citizens group called Tree City Pacifica. We organize Arbor Day in Pacifica and support the city's Tree City USA designation. The Pacifica Arbor Day proclamation recognizes that trees combat climate change, which is in alignment with the city's climate action goals. For this reason and many others, Tree City Pacifica supports mitigation for the removal of trees. At the last planning commission meeting, I requested that if 57 trees are removed, the commission require the developer to plant three trees for each heritage tree and one tree for each of the other trees logged. The city of South San Francisco, which has been a Tree City USA for more than 30 years, has a plant back requirement of three trees for every heritage tree removed. Also, at a recent Pacifica City Council meeting, the council voted for a three to one replacement ratio for heritage trees removed in a Rockaway development. In lieu of the three to one replacement for heritage trees and one to one for trees and logging operations, Tree City Pacifica also supports the payment of fees into a tree fund. The city of Pacifica does not have sufficient funds for tree maintenance and replacement. 
the tree budget under public works has gone from over 50 weeks of maintenance a year to only six weeks a year. Other cities help cover the cost of tree maintenance and replacement by creating a mitigation fee structure that goes into a specific tree fund. We request that if you approve this development, you require the tree replacement ratio of three to one for heritage trees and one to one for other trees logged or mitigation fees for a Pacifica tree fund. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schumacher. Uh, can we have the next speaker, please? Next, we have Ann Crow. Please go ahead. Ann Crow, please go Ms. ahead. Ms. Crow, are you there? Mr. Murdoch, I wonder if we shouldn't just uh, pass up Ms. Crow by and maybe we can circle back. The next speaker is Paul Toda. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm also part of Tree City Pacifica, and I just wanted to mention that as part of, as the city of Pacifica considers policies regarding replacing downed trees, I encourage the city to do what it can to replace both heritage trees and others that are felled to make way for development. I urge this because we're living in unprecedented times. Since the beginning of the year, there have been over 8,300 wildfires that have burned more than 4 million acres in California. In short, our trees are going up in smoke, and that smoke is making our planet and us sicker than ever. Even though Pacifica hasn't lost trees due to fires, we can do our part to help the state recover those that have been lost. And as trees help clean the air, we need to protect and add to our current tree population. I also support the three to one ratio for heritage tree replacement and the one to one for logging operations, or 750 for heritage trees and 250 for log trees to supply a city tree fund. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Toda. Uh, next speaker, please. Next, we have Nancy Foster. Ms. Foster, please uh, proceed. Relief. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Nancy Foster, and I live on Monterey Road. After reading the information in the staff's report, I've become very concerned about this project. The report that jumped out to me the most is one performed by Swipe, Soil Water Air Protection Enterprise, where they conclude that the emissions and health risk impacts are underestimated and inadequately addressed. According to them, if you are within 150 feet of this project, then the infant, child, and lifetime cancer risks are 20 times the, allow the allowable threshold. Commissioners, my husband and I, along with my two small children, easily live within that range of the project. How can the staff not demand a more thorough evaluation of this impact before allowing it to move forward? especially since, according to the report, the data originally provided by the applicant to model emissions and health risks were so far off to the point that they were basically suspect. I understand that there is a disagreement over these results, but that fact along expert disagreement require an environmental impact report this project needs a real review that cannot be compromised. Please demand an environmental impact report if this project is allowed to proceed. Thank you in advance for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Foster. Uh, I, I wonder if uh, Ms. Crow is uh, available at this point. Do you wanna check Mr. Murdoch and see if she's able to join us? Don't wanna lose track of her. Ms. Crow, please go ahead if you're there. Okay. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for your patience. My name is Ann Crow. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. All right. I live on Hickey Boulevard, close to the area where the trees may be removed. There is constant traffic on Hickey and Monterey. The 57 trees have been doing their 
innate work to pull the carbon emissions daily from this area. Their removal will be a loss that can directly affect the health of all the neighbors. New trees to replace them must be implemented in the area. I'm also concerned for the wildlife that lives there and will be affected adversely. Change is inevitable, but common sense change can be enacted that preserves and restores the health of the air for all. Breathing is fundamental. Trees are our host to good living. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crow. Uh, next speaker, please. Next, we have Christine Bowles. Ms. Bowles, please go ahead. Um, thank you, um, commissioners. Um, again, my name is Christine Bowles. I'm a licensed architect and I live on Monterey Road just downhill from the project site. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just say that Mr. Contrabecki gives me way too much credit. Um, since February, when I filed my first complaint about this project, my main concerns related to the threat of hazards that this project would create due to such large scale transformation of this very steep site. I honestly don't understand how the project has gotten this far in the planning process. Most Bay Area cities I work in would have rejected this proposal from the start and not wasted everyone's time and money. Instead, the current planning department and failing to do their due diligence to require thorough geotechnical investigations has downplayed the very real threats this project poses. Based on faulty analysis in the staff report for the August 3rd meeting, the commission seemed ready to approve this project until the neighbors started speaking up. We wanna personally thank commissioners Big Stick, Berman and Hauser who gave enough credence to our complaints to allow the project to be continued. Since August 3rd, the newly formed Vistamar Preservation Alliance got to work. Together, we spent hundreds of hours analyzing the projects and tens of thousands of dollars hiring experts that call into question the validity of the initial environmental study and mitigated ne negative declaration. In the last two weeks, we were finally given access to some, but not all, of the project files we requested. Those files are damning. The discovery of additional geotechnical investigations that show four previous landslides, subsurface water at the end of August, and the presence of a natural spring on the site clearly shows that the project geotechnical and biological analysis is not thorough as is required by CEQA and um, as is required in the general plan for projects on this hillside. Um, I'd like to, to read a section of the general plan that I've um, said in my letter several times about the large steep area on Monterey Road, which is our neighborhood. It requires a thorough geotechnical investigation, not done, in recognition of the high visibility of the area, which Bonnie argues or whoever in the staff report that it's not visible, it is very visible if you walk around or drive around our area and I encourage you to do so. Um, the, the project does not minimize height, which is a requirement of this section of general plan. We're at the height maximum. Um, of 35 feet, plus we're building an ex on an extra 18 feet of fill. The, the project will tower 57 feet over the street. The building mass is factored in the, in the, in the, in the height, but also um, articulation and relationship to the community. This project towers over the neighborhood and is not appropriate for this site. And the retaining walls are ridiculous. To, the says to, that retaining walls need to be minimized to the extent feasible. There are so many retaining walls, 25 feet plus and high, stepped up to 30, 40 feet in some areas. Um, there's no way you can say this project meets the general plan and therefore you cannot approve this project today. Thank you, Ms. Bowles. Next, com uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Kai Martin. Mr. Martin, please go ahead. Hey, good evening. Um, my name is Kai Martin, of course, a citizen of Pacifica and a member of the community group Tree City Pacifica. Uh, as noted by others, Tree City Pacifica supports the mitigation for the removal of trees. I also want to echo the support of the group for the payment of fees into a tree fund to be used by the city for tree maintenance and replacement. Um, trees help in a lot of different ways. A mature, a mature tree can absorb approximately 150 kilograms of CO2 per year, um, cutting down 57 trees, a lot of which are mature, um, impacts all of that. Uh, trees can reduce 60% of particulates from car exhaust, as well as reducing ozone, dust, dirt, and smoke. Um, they can increase property value and rents. 
they added by, to the biodiversity and they provide runoff control. As some of the folks uh, noted, there's some serious concerns about the uh, slope of the hill and, and uh, slides and those types of things. Um, trees block noise as much as 40% and uh, shoppers claim to spend more when there's a lot of trees. What this boils down to is that tree maintenance and replacement is critical to enjoying the benefits that trees bring and the city of Pacifica does not have sufficient funds. It's often cheaper to cut down a tree than to maintain it. We need our trees, we need to maintain or replace them. The city needs funding to accomplish this. While I support the three to one replacement for heritage trees and one to one for logging operations, developer or private individual planting three young trees in the ground that at times die with poor care does not achieve what the city of Pacifica is trying to accomplish with the heritage tree ordinance and the climate action goals. I suggest a $750 per heritage tree or $250 per tree in a logging operation fee that would go directly into a city tree fund. It's vital for our community now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Next speaker, please. Next is Summer Lee. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Summer Lee and I've lived on Monterey Road for 20 years. It's rare for a current project file to start with a date that goes back 18 years. It's very rare for a staff report to ignore the project's history when being presented to a planning commission for approval. This project technically started in 2002, but in reality it started in 91 when Caveria brought a nearly identical project of nine units to the planning commission and city council where it was denied. It was denied for the same reasons it should be denied tonight. It quote, finds that the design of the subdivision and the proposed improvements are likely to cause substantial environmental damage. Upon rejection, Caveria says on record, he will not change its design. He also admits he cannot meet the geotech review requirements. In 2002, Caveria changes the project name and opens application with the same project with one less unit against the city's 91 request for a substantial reduction in units and total redesign. He submits a geotech report done in 2002 that only performs two peripheral borings. He fails to bring forth a 91 geotech report that performs 12 borings, finds groundwater and four landslides on the property. Even still in 2004, planning staff determined that Caveria's application is incomplete and outdated. During this time, the Planning Commission has a study session that overwhelmingly denies the project because of site difficulties and hazards. In 2007, the project comes back to planning and staff again determines that the project application is complete for lack of analysis. In 2010, Caveria submits a new hydrology report and a biological constraints analysis performed in 2007. His report calls for a wetland delineation. Four years later, Caveria resubmits the project and claims that the project has no connection to biologically sensitive areas and proposes a driveway over the wetland. Yet again, the planning staff finds the application incomplete, citing issues like too high retaining walls. Six months later, Caveria submits again, claiming no heritage trees on site. Tina states in a memo that they cannot exempt the project because Caveria's own submitted 2007 report states a high likelihood of wetland. Caveria replies he would rather keep the project as designed and calls his own report erroneous. He has to go to the Planning Commission. At this time, the Commission does a joint study session with City Council and overwhelmingly denies the project, again because of site difficulty. The last thing in the records is around 2000, uh, 2018 when Caveria becomes an officer and shareholder in Vistamar. This long timeline makes clear the only real geotech survey this project has had is from 91 and it was so negative it killed the project. The project has been rejected over and over since 2002 with the applicant bringing the project back again and again in his own words with no meaningful changes. What has changed, however, is that the reports that warn against this project somehow fall out of the records. I end with the irony when Contrabecki writes into the record threatening that one neighbor is upholding the process, claiming li li in litigious terms that this is not a regular process and the law provides for the review of projects. No, sir, these 18 years have not been regular. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Next uh, speaker, please. Next is Sandy Ayers. Please go ahead. Thank you for the time. Um, I wanted to say that I'm a resident of Pacifica and a landscape architect. I've been practicing on the peninsula for 20 years, um, have come across, been part of a lot of development and a lot of uh, mitigation. And I've seen a lot of tree ordinances as well along the way. And um, I know that we're trying to adopt one here in Pacifica. And I think this project is a pretty good 
thought to start with the implementation of the tree fund that was um, proposed earlier by my fellow citizens. Uh, I was part of a project recently in San Mateo and their specific uh, heritage tree ordinance is got a really interesting um, calculation in the way that they do it with species values, condition value, location value, but basically through this mathematical process, you wind up with a landscape unit value per tree, um, which is which is multiplied by a multiplier. And and you can mitigate this with some plant planting back trees, but as we know, you can't always fit a two to one or even three to one ratio of trees back onto a site once you removed it, and nor should you probably try in most instances without uh, jeopardizing the health of the future trees. So ideally, we'd be creating some sort of a surplus, um, which would be then donated into a fund that could be used for the maintenance of trees that we already have and planting of new trees elsewhere. Um, specifically, the project that was on recently in San Mateo, the a single tree, a 50.5 inch caliper cedar tree with the way that they calculated um, the LU value and their times their multiplier of $321 per LU value. The cost of that one tree um, was $7,524. So I think the pre-proposed uh, $750 per replacement tree and um, I believe it was $250 for a tree for logging is a fraction of that. Um, but even at those numbers, we, we, could, we could generate a lot of value for the city of Pacifica and maintaining the trees that we already have, which is extremely underfunded. Um, I would like to see the council apply that to this project, um, initiate that fund with this project and uh, and let it be something that we can contribute to going forward um, via you know this vehicle of, uh, of, of not punitive damages, but in lieu damages of planting, um, and also possibly even contributions from the public, right? Um, if, if, for instance, somebody wanted to donate money to the tree fund, I would like to see that be a possibility. I do think it's something of great value. I do think it's a fair ask of uh, anyone proposing development, um, kind of a win-win as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ayers. Uh, next speaker, please. Next, we have uh, Nimi Madhu. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh... Good evening, commissioners. My name is Nimi Matthew, and I live uphill on Monterey from the proposed construction site. I would like to thank uh, the Planning Commission for this opportunity to express my concerns. Before I jump into my concerns, I did want to uh, extend a shout out to Christine and Bob Bowles for helping me and other neighbors make sense of the Vistamar development plans and the impact to the neighborhood. Contrary to what Mr. Kontrabecki indicated, the assistance provided by the Bowles to concern neighborhood concerned neighbors have been invaluable. My major concern today is on the impact of parking due to the proposed construction. Monterey and Hickey Road uh, are al already very busy streets with limited parking due to a school, church, and residential units. With this construction, my understanding is that we will lose roughly 300 feet of curb space, taking away 15 precious parking spots. This project will re reduce the already scarce available parking on both of these streets. Additionally, any social gatherings or parties arising from the new development will further add to this situation and take away more parking spots. I did want to highlight two points regarding existing parking constraint. constraints. First, the condo unit at 504 Monterey, which is right across the proposed development, has faced erosion issues and their parking areas are unusable, as Commissioner Big Stick noted. Hence, they have been using the available street parking along Monterey, which will now be taken away, and this will again take away uh, available parking along the streets. Secondly, the strip of Hickey Boulevard near the development area is also used as a, par as a school parking uh, spots for parents during the morning drop-off and after-school pickups for the Sunset Ridge Elementary School. The increased number of dump trucks and vehicles during the construction will adversely affect the limited parking on Hickey Boulevard. In addition to a parking shortage, we will also face increased traffic and noise during and post construction. I urge the commission to seriously reconsider this plan given the impact to the neighborhood and not approve this project. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Matthew. Next speaker, please. Next we have Claudia De Luna. Good evening, staff and commissioners. My name is Claudia De Luna. 
My family and I have lived in Pacifica on Monterey Road for over 13 years. There's been quite a lot of back and forth on concerns around this project. I have to say that analysis is not mitigation. If I take my car to my mechanic with a knocking noise in the engine, he doesn't tell me to keep driving it and hopefully nothing bad will happen. We have differing expert opinions on several levels. Given this, the legal guidance we've received is that an EIR is required. That's the prescribed process for moving forward in these circumstances. We all believe that a thorough analysis via an EIR will show the clear rationale for not building on, on this land. There is a more important point to be made here though. Should this land be developed at all? Starting with a 1980 general plan, the section of land was called out specifically as the large steep area along Monterey Road and Norfolk Place. Conditions in that plan begin with requiring a thorough geotechnical investigation, which I know has been mentioned already. That tells me that even 40 years ago, the, the instability of the slope was known and recognized. It then states that height, mass, and retention walls should be minimized as much as possible in recognition of the high visibility of the area. It's been argued that the project is not visible from Monterey Road, but it is highly visible from other places and even further out. And I believe that's what the authors of the 1980 general plan meant to convey. It's a part of the Pacifica Vista as you move southward into Pacifica. And since then, that we have seen former staff and planning commissioners deny this development for many of the same reasons this group of neighbors and concerned Pacifica homeowners are citing. We have seen draft plans earmarked uh, the land as part of the Hillside Preservation District. If the updated general plan had been approved per the original schedule, we would not even be here today as the land would have been designated as Rosa and this proposed development would not be suitable. The city's intent for that land is captured in developing versions of the general plan is clear. Please don't allow this development to progress by exploiting the gap between the city of Pacifica's vision for itself captured in the updated general plan and delays in implementing that new general plan. I'd like to conclude uh, that it does seem to me that there might be an unhealthy real estate influence in these proceedings um, and we're committed to finding ways um, to reduce that influence. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. DeLuna. Uh, next speaker, please. Next is Elisa Bowles. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you, commissioners. Hi, I'm Elisa Bowles, and I'm a part-time resident on Monterey Road, downstream of the Vistamar Project. I'm also a PhD student in civil, civil and environmental engineering at Stanford. I and many other neighbors are extremely concerned about water runoff and flooding from this project. The developer and his civil engineer prodded by our concerns have made some amendments to the project drainage design since the last commission hearing. They claim that post-construction runoff will be less than the natural runoff, but there are major errors in their calculations that are really disquieting. Review by our civil engineering consultant, Cliff Bechtel, shows that the design of the drainage system is flawed. There are large areas of the ground that are noted as permeable in the BAM calculations that will actually drain into retaining wall subdrains, not into the ground as suggested in the calculations. Natural underground water would also get pushed against these retaining walls and funneled into the storm drain. None of this additional water has been accounted for. The BAM calculations are flawed and do not prove that post-construction runoff will be equal or less than pre-construction runoff. Additionally, the hydrology report or drainage study submitted for the project is extremely limited in scope and its map misidentifies the swales catchment area, showing a much smaller area than the real area. A Stanford hydrology professor that I showed the report to said that if their student had turned this in, they would have failed the assignment. No effort was made to study the effect of the property's runoff in combination with runoff from upstream properties and its effect on downstream properties. There is not even a record of existing storm drain facilities in the vicinity of the project. How can you assure us that this project won't exacerbate flooding in our neighborhood? Further intense geotechnical and hydrologic studies need to be prepared before even considering approval for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowles. Next speaker, please. Next is Chris Lopez. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please uh, proceed. Hi, good evening. Uh, yeah, my name is Chris Lopez, and I live on Nelson Avenue. 
My backyard runs into the creek that this project would impact, and I expressed my concerns about the existing drainage and erosion issues at the meeting on August 3rd. I was really relieved to hear Commissioner Bigstick insist that me on that meeting that when the project comes back to the commission, it should have calculations for those of us concerned about the drainage issues so that the commission can be confident in responding to those concerns. But as the bowls point out, we don't have any of the information that we were promised. The staff report says that the documentation has been reviewed by the engineering staff and peer reviewed, but no peer reviewer is named and their review is not included in the staff report. It sounds like there's more information being withheld and not brought forward from this application, uh, applicant and the staff report. Now, the geologist that we hired to review the project claims that the water table has not been accounted for in the design and that it might destabilize the hillside. You know, why, why are we not stopping and studying this? To just vaguely dismiss this or promise to study it down the road is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of alarming. The project dives 35 feet into the ground on a 52% slope. I think it's incumbent on the commission to insist on the third party analysis of all of these concerns before letting it proceed. You know, uh, commissioners, please do, do not let this project proceed until an EIR is performed. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Uh, next uh, speaker, please. Next speaker is Garrick Meeker. Please go ahead. Hi. Hi, my name is Garrick Meeker and I live, live a few houses from the Vistamar project. I'm concerned about the drainage swale wetland at the south end of the project and how it will be drained. There's currently a big concrete headwall collecting the stormwater for which the city has maintenance responsibility. The area is covered with wetland vegetation, but it is fairly easy to reach to drain to maintain it. Any debris that flows past the drain goes onto a wide plain before it hits the sidewalk in the road. The new design pushes the collection point up the hill behind a tall retaining wall out of, out of sight of the new residents who will be re responsible for its maintenance. It will be difficult to reach the drain and it will probably be covered with vegetation shortly after construction. Our civil engineering consultant says the new drain design will easily clog so the debris which comes down the hill will have to find another path to drain, which will be a narrow concrete spillway next to the new driveway. It seems clear that the water and debris from a big storm will shoot out onto the road with some force and just the street um, has uh, clogged in the past few winters. We've seen uh, these large grates pop out of the gutters and this is an area that's visible. Um, can we trust the homeowners to be responsible for a system they don't normally see? Is it fair to make them responsible for drainage of water which primarily comes from other properties up the hill? I think the city should continue to maintain the system and that it should be designated, uh, that it should be designed properly to minimize the risk of clogging. Ideally, the wetland and swale should be left as is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meeker. Uh, next speaker, please. Next, we have uh, Susan. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Susan Miller and I live in Rockaway Beach. I am very well aware of this Vista Mar um, development and have spoken with the neighbors and agree totally with all of their research into this project. And I would ask that staff uh, demand an environmental impact report and that the project not go ahead until much further study and all the neighbors questions are answered. I also have learned uh, at tonight's meeting that there will be a requirement for the HOA to maintain the drainage for this project. How will the, how will that be monitored? Will the city monitor the HOA that they will do the right and correct monitoring of the drainage or will it just be up to them? I would like to see the city be able to monitor their maintenance. I'm also a part of Tree City Pacifica and like what my um, buddies on the Tree City Pacifica have already said, I'd like to say that I would like $750 per each 
heritage tree that's removed to be added to a fund or $250 for non-heritage trees. I would also like the, when trees are replaced in the area or any place in Pacifica, that these are Pacifica appropriate trees. The Tree City Pacifica has a list of trees that do well in our town. And I would ask that any uh, landscaping that's done, uh, those trees be considered so that the trees will grow well in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, next speaker, please. Next, we have Kristen Kramer. Thank you, please go ahead. Good, good evening, commissioners. My name is Kristen Kramer. I live on Nelson Avenue. On August 3rd, Commissioner Berman asked the staff to explain why this site does not qualify for an EIR process. Bonnie correctly explained that an EIR is triggered when a project may have the potential for significant impacts that may not be mitigated to less than significant. In his email to you on Friday, my attorney, Mr. Gaffney, confirms this and furthers that the law sets a very simple and very low threshold for this triggering. But it takes only one, one expert to conclude that the project will have a potentially adverse impact, even with mitigation. You can have two, three, four experts in agreement, but if one expert disagrees and if there's any doubt, then an EIR must be prepared to resolve the doubt. That is the law. Since August 3rd, we have brought you six extremely reputable experts that submit that this project will have adverse impacts that cannot be mitigated. Our evidence is overwhelming. So overwhelming, in fact, that Mr. Contrabecki himself reached out to our geologist and personally threatened him, saying that he, if he did not retract his conclusions by October 5th, he would take action against him. At a minimum, this is blatant intimidation, and it's also a tell that our findings are substantial. So then why hasn't the staff initiated an EIR? I think an email that Bonnie sent to the applicant on February 14th, 2019, suggests that maybe they too are being intimidated. In the email, Bonnie informs the applicant of the city's choice for consultant for the initial study. She explains that the city has chosen the firm M Group because the significantly lower bid from Rainey had failed to address four main areas of impact required under CEQA. Mr. Contrabecki replies, objecting to the decision and insists on an in-person meeting. Apparently that meeting wasn't very fun for the staff because they overturned their written decision and low bid Rainey became the project's consultant. So now we have an ISMND whose mitigations are merely vague promises to study it later and their answers boil down to quote, we believe that won't be an issue. In working with the staff, it's clear they feel their hands are tied and would welcome some cover and relief from the commissioners. Two staff members uh, explicitly said that we make sure to take our case to the commissioners. So here we are commissioners, you cannot be intimidated by an excessively litigious applicant. That is the privilege of your position but it is also your obligation to not defer here. Do not kick this monstrosity down the road, please. You have before you overwhelming and substantial evidence of potential impact from top shelf experts. And you also have a community that is alarmed, in need of your help and right behind you. It's above, all your, it's above all of our pay grades to try and argue with these experts point by point. That's not the purpose of the CEQA process. Instead, the only question you have to answer is, is there any doubt or disagreement between the experts regarding the potential impacts of this project? The answer here is a resounding yes. Please give this project the proper review that your community deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kramer. Next speaker, please. Kelsey Coles. Please go ahead. Good. Uh, do we still have you there? Good evening. Can you hear me okay? I can. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Kelsey Coles. I live on Norfolk Drive, just down slope of the proposed development. Uh, one of the reasons I moved to Pacifica is because of the amazing variety of wildlife that we have here. So when I read... You know, Ms. Coles, we, we can't hear you now. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, why don't you start over? Sorry about that. It keeps asking me to unmute. Um, so uh, one of the reasons I, I moved to Pacifica was because of the amazing variety of wildlife that we have here. 
Um, so when I read the developer commissioned a WRA report on the biological resources of Vistamar, I was astonished by its failure to capture a diversity and abundance of important wildlife on that property. Uh, Sean Smallwood, the renowned UC Davis expert, he commented on WRA's report, visited the site and reviewed the ISMND. His findings stated that the project will result in potentially significant detrimental and or adverse biological impacts, even with implementation of the proposed mitigation measures. <clears throat> Though the city attorneys have allowed for further future analysis at the building phase as a mitigation, it seems that they are ignoring your role and responsibilities as commissioners to evaluate this project by making sure it adheres to the general plan and the CEQA law. This uses a standard evaluation before granting approval, not at the building phase. In this case, it's because you cannot bring an endangered bird back to life. You can't rebuild a destroyed nest. You can't take back the carbon emitted into the atmosphere by transplanting or logging a 30 year old tree. This is why evaluation is done now, not later, to see if there is a hazard that cannot be reversed and to see if there are alternatives. Because Dr. Smallwood found the impacts on wildlife cannot be mitigated to less than significant by the negative declaration, an EIR must be implemented, as a number of others have mentioned. You don't need to deliberate on whether you think WRA's pro-developer re report is more qualified and accurate than Dr. Smallwood's data and science. The legal standard is simple. Dr. Smallwood cast out on WRA's report using substantial evidence and EIR is the law. So as mentioned, again, for 18, over 18 years, Pacifica has denied this project. And now the residents you represent have delivered substantial evidence, we believe to support denial. So at the very least, we just ask that there's no harm for you commissioners to take your role back from the city attorneys and ask for an expanded analysis of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coles. Uh, next speaker, please. Wei Feng. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, um, I can, go ahead. Yeah, I, actually, uh, the, that's my name's Gary Benjamin. That was my wife's name. Uh, she was on a Zoom earlier, but um, in any case, um, I just want to reiterate uh, that uh, uh, given all the things that have been raised by prior speakers and the letters that you have in your packet, um, this is an extremely risky project. And I'd like to highlight one area of that. Um, you know, in my business career, I've had uh, the opportunity to several times manage vendor evaluations in the tens of millions of dollars and uh, the most important thing we look at is the reliability and the track record of the vendor. And I would like to talk about the track record of this company, TKG. Um, TKG filed for bankruptcy in 2002. 10 years later in 2012, that bankruptcy was still being litigated. Um, during the, the process, uh, John Contrabecki was found guilty by the bankruptcy judge of being in contempt of court for having attempted to hide TKG assets by transferring ownership of those assets to companies owned by a friend of his in Poland. The, ju the judge ordered Mr. Kontrabecki to unwind the transfers and he did not comply. So the judge imposed fines leading up to $15,000 per day. Eventually, Mr. Kontrabecki, Mr. Kontrabecki was incarcerated for uh, failing to comply with the court. Um, finally, he was able to uh, uh, meet the judge's demands and unwind the transactions. This is uh, the sort of person that uh, you're talking about going into business with. Um, now, this, this is a, again, is a very risky project and once the hillside is destroyed, there's no going back if uh, the builders discover conditions that will make the project more expensive, or if the economy takes a dive and the project no longer looks like it's gonna be profitable, then given their track record, they may just decide to walk away. 
and then Pacifica taxpayers would have to foot the bill for trying to repair the hillside in order to mitigate the flood and landslide, landslide risk. Uh, for these reasons and all the other reasons that have been raised by uh, other people, uh, um, I, urge the, I urge the commission to reject this project. Thank you, Mr. Benjamin. Next speaker, please. Those are all the hands I see raised, Chair. Okay, we'll go ahead and- uh, uh, One additional speaker just raised a hand. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and call on that speaker? Raina Heights. Please go ahead. Hi. Hi, my name is Raina Hines. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I live on Norfolk, just down slope with a proposed development. I'm concerned about the current wetland and biodiversity special status species evaluation with reference to the wetlands. Um, an official de wetland delineation hasn't been done. With the criteria met, the delineation is under the jurisdiction of the US Army Corps of Engineers and CDFW, and the delineation is a legal obligation under the Clean Water Act and CEQA. It's not legal to do a wetland delineation as a pre-construction mitigation effort. It must be done as part of CEQA when there's evidence of one and evidence of wetland and riparian habitat was documented in the 2007 Live Oak Biological Report with additional evidence in the 2019 WRA Biological Resource Assessment and its potential corroborated by our community hired local biologist of Coast Ridge Ecology, supporting evidence um, Capturing this criteria necessary for wetland delineation includes one, the California Fish and Wildlife map data, the ACE database, indicating wetland riparian habitat presence at the proposed site, two, the WRA's biological resource assessment, documenting one, the presence of an arroyo willow thicket, and two, an ephemeral drainage or ditch or stream. In addition, the 27, 2007, uh, Live Oak Biological Report documents three, the potential for hydric inclusion soils, meaning criteria combined, analyzing wetland presence and a lake and stream bed alteration agreement or a 1600 are under the jurisdiction of the US Army Corps of Engineers and or CDFW and it's required to be completed and approved by CDFW prior to project approval or for permitting. Additionally, um, if there is a wetland, the project would need to be completely redesigned to move the driveway off of this area. Uh, our affordable units, a condition of approval. The Bonnie stated that additional separations from wetlands would not be required as the project was not in the coastal zone. If a wetland was confirmed, subsequent major project revisions would likely move the driveway north, thereby reducing the number of units from eight to seven and thus losing its affordable unit requirement. Second, addressing biodiversity and special species status, there's a need for an EIR. There are numerous records of special status plant and wildlife species in the vicinity, so only an in-depth field survey would adequately address all the possibilities prior to project approval, not as pre-construction mitigation, especially regarding California red legged garter snakes, hoary bats, and importantly, mission blue butterflies and Calipe silver spots, where these later species are documented, I'm sorry, latter species, are documented less than a mile away, and the butterfly presence absence was surveyed at the wrong time of year in the July 2019 um, WRA report, not in April or May when they're present on host plants. So looking into the future, we need commissioners who align with and represent our values as a coastal community, and please align with Gavin Newsom's new executive order seeking to conserve 30% of the state's land and coastal waters by 2030. Uh, I think that's all my time. <laughs> it is. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Thank you. Mr. Murdoch, do we have any other speakers? Are there no hands raised now for our dial-in participants? A reminder to press star nine to raise your hand if you'd like to speak. All right, well. And there are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you. Well, I recognize that we, I think we actually had 10 minutes of comment <clears throat> from the uh, uh, from the applicant, but I'm gonna afford the applicant um, three minutes uh, to, to respond to anything in particular it wants to uh, based on the, uh, the comment that we've, uh, uh, that we heard from the public. Mr. Chavarri, I don't know if you wanna take that on or whether that's too tight a timeline to do anything constructive. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Nibelin. Um, I'd like to, um, uh, speak to a couple of items in there. Um, it was uh, 
raise the fact that some of the calculations were faulty regarding the drainage. Um, we have used uh, a published software uh, by the San Mateo County, which is BAM. Um, we have uh, modeled the site uh, according to the instructions on how to do that project. Um, we are not using uh, any permeable area. We are not using any infiltration on the site. If all the areas are being accounted onto the system. So uh, is it 100% perfect and correct right now? Probably not. There will be adjustments and there will be improvements done through the process of the building permit, through the process of formal design. But uh, for the status of the conceptual design that we have right now, um, I think that the project is properly designed, that the drainage is working correctly. And um, to that effect, uh, I feel confident to put my name, my, my professional stamp behind that. And not only mine, but that of another three or four professional engineers that work in our firm. Um, regarding the, the sidewalk replacement, uh, that we were speaking earlier, uh, there is no need to replace a sidewalk when it's not damaged. In fact, replacing the sidewalk that is not damaged will in increase the impact in the area, will create more disturbance and will create more problems for the site. We have uh, added to the plans a note that clearly establishes that we will repair any area of the public right of way, sidewalk, street, and anything in the frontage of the property that is in defective or not accepted condition to the city engineer, whether it is existing and is damaged, whether it's damaged by the construction, but at the end of the project, we want to have a perfectly looking area. Um, there has been uh, a lot of uh, talk and communications uh, about the adequacy of the work. Uh, I respect the professionals that they have hired to evaluate the project, but the professionals that we have hired as well to prepare um, all our reports, the biology, um, the drainage, uh, and, and everything else uh, are also reputable people, are also licensed people. Um, and uh, uh, the consultants that the city uh, have in staff, just like uh, 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 the soils engineer that review the previous reports and he acknowledged have reviewed that all the report from 1991 um, those are well qualified people that uh, will not have any benefit on the endorsing the project or saying that what we've done is correct if they didn't feel that it was properly and correctly done um there was talks on Chavarria, yeah, mr uh, Chavarria, yeah, i was I think we're, we're going to need to wind that up. It's, it's oh. quite possible that things will come back to you um, oh, oh. as questions or comments from, from members of the commission, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and... Uh, may, I we'll may, I, may I make Mr. a brief comment? Uh, Mr. Contrabeck, yeah, again, if, insofar as we have uh, stuff that comes back from the commission, you may have the opportunity to, but uh, at this point, um, just in, in terms of keeping things on track and sort of honoring the ordinary process that we use in terms of you know, time for various parties, we're going to go ahead and... Uh, Bring the matter back to the uh, the planning commission and for uh, deliberation. So, well, the, so that's the, what we will. Only, that's what we will do, only, Mr. Contra, Mr. Becky. We're going to go ahead and bring it back to the commission. And uh, like I said, it's it's possible that uh, we'll have something that uh, you know affords the opportunity to talk. But uh, uh, but again, I'm going to let the, the commissioners do their do their thing now. Um, so we've had uh, public comment, and uh, so at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, bring it back for. Uh, uh, deliberation. Uh, Commissioner Berman, I'll let you go ahead and start. Thank you. Um, so a lot of my clarification questions were answered and already asked by uh, commissioners earlier. I did want to wait to hear um, the applicant's uh, initial um, presentation and public comment because um, there were more items presented in public comment that I wanted to think about. But um, first, I guess um, starting off with the storm drainage, um, Mr. Chavarria, I really appreciate the effort that you put into this planning submittal. Um, as someone that has used 
the BAM program um, on the coast side even and on a very steeply sloped undeveloped lot. Um, I do, I know that this program is not intuitive to just an average person. You kind of have to actually run the program to really understand it. Um, but I really appreciate the, the efforts that you and the applicant have done to complete not only the BAM model, but also the San Mateo County stormwater treatment calculations for each drainage management area. Um, I appreciated looking through that, which is why I didn't really have many questions at the beginning of this meeting regarding drainage. Um, but in an effort to just touch on my perspective of the drainage on the site, um, understanding that the hydro modification requirements for um, almost any site on the peninsula is gonna be more stringent than typical C3 uh, treatment requirements. Um, it really comforts me to know that the, the BAM model, even if it is preliminary, um, given that we're not in the building permit phase, the BAM model um, was performed from the two year to the 25 year storm, which I believe, um, which is I think typically BAM, um, the state requires two year to 10 year um, for hydro modification. So um, with that, I know there were some comments regarding the pervious surfaces on site that um, will inevitably drain to the storm drain system. I personally don't find these to be an issue. And actually I can tell from the calculations, the report from the BAM model that the pervious areas are accounted for in the basins. Um, so basically the, the drainage management area of the site do account for the pervious areas, which have a different runoff coefficient because it's, uh, it's the difference between pouring a bucket of water on uh, impervious concrete versus pouring a bucket of water, water on um, just a compacted gravel. So um, I'm happy to see that. The, um, in regards to the uh, drainage capacities downstream, of the site, um, I too feel comfortable with what the applicant has presented. Given the hydro modification requirements of the site, um, effectively the site has to, by state permit requirements, they have to attenuate the flows and the volumes from the site in an effort to protect the, um, the local stream that this site discharges to. So um, I feel confident just because the applicant is showing compliance with um, the state permit, uh, stormwater treatment and BMP requirements. I feel satisfied with the, the stormwater management at the site. Um, Moving on from that, because I, I don't, actually, I do have a question regarding the stormwater treatment. Um, there was mention that there's three detention tanks. I only saw two on the stormwater management plan. Can someone direct me to where the third one is? There are, there's one located at the far north end of the driveway. There is one located close to Monterey Road behind the sidewalk below unit one. And there is a third located where the driveway intersects Monterey Road at the south end of the project. Okay, the one near unit one is the one that I missed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple other questions independent of drainage. Um, can staff please reiterate why an EIR is not required for this project? Ms. Sharma, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. So the legal standard for preparing an AIR is that the 
city must prepare an EIR whenever substantial evidence in the record supports a fair argument that a project may have a significant effect on the environment. And so if substantial evidence in the record supports a fair argument, um, then the local agency must prepare an EIR, even if other substantial evidence exists, um, indicating that there is no significant effect. However, facts, reasonable assumptions predicated on facts, expert opinions, all constitute substan substantial evidence. Um, but argument, um, speculation, unsubstantiated opinions or narrative or evidence that is inaccurate or erroneous or evidence that is in, for some reason not credible does not count towards um, substantial evidence. And so staff has provided responses to various expert reports and comments, which tend to show that the comments received fall in the latter category as they generally attack the methodology used to reach conclusions, but do not do not definitively provide that uh, substantial evidence in the record supports uh, that there would be a significant effect on the environment. Um, but I would say that it's ultimately the commission's task to determine whether there is substantial evidence in the record and would refer you to staff for any specific technical questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Sharma. Um, in regards to the record, so what, sorry, this, this is a rudimentary question, but what is the record? Is it the staff report that has all the public comments incorporated with it? The record is all of the information that is before you. So the ISM MND, the public comments, um, the written comments, um, the comments you've just heard, for example, uh, those would all be the record that is in front of you. What is typically the city's stance on receiving technical reports or memorandums from professionals in a certain field just as a public comment? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Um, it, for example, um, if so, we obviously have our, our city engineers. Um, we have a third party engineer present tonight um, on behalf of the city performing reviews. But then if, if a member of the public is a civil engineer, for example, and they submit a report from their professional opinion as a public comment, that is a public comment, but it's also a professional opinion. What's what's usually the city's stance on that? Just to protect the city, um, mainly. Uh, I would just provide that um, it is the commission's role to evaluate the credibility of that information. Um, so, because a public commenter does have credentials um, that could weigh in favor of it being substantial evidence, but that doesn't necessarily make it dispositive that it is. Um, beyond that, I, I don't know if the city has any usual or customary practices. And so I think uh, Ms. Sharma, yes. you know, additionally, it's relevant to consider not only is the comment perhaps from a, an objective third party licensed professional or other qualified expert, but is there some potential personal bias or benefit uh, gained from providing the comments? So for example, um, a licensed professional who lives right next door to a project and may be opposed to the project, you may need to weigh the, uh, weigh the credibility of the professional opinion being rendered when there's also likely a significant personal uh, benefit or um, impact from the project that could have influenced that professional opinion. So I think that's a practical example of what Ms. Sharma is indicating as to weighing the credibility of that licensed professional's opinion. Correct. Thank you. Sorry, I know that was a, an odd question, but curiosity. Um, let's see. Um, 
there were a good amount of questions on um, actually trees, which um, I think I appreciate the community's concern with trees and landscaping. Um, and I'm wondering a couple questions revolving those comments. Um, can you remind me what is the amount of new trees being replaced? How many new trees are being replaced? I think it's, is it six heritage trees being removed and then how many are being planted? Um, so I can take that. So uh, the preliminary uh, landscaping plan shows that um, six heritage trees will be removed. The applicant has proposed 14 replacement trees for those six. Um, so it, it's a replacement ratio of greater than two to one. Um, in addition, the applicant has proposed a number of other trees on the site. Um, the total number um, is, um, they've only detailed 10, um, 10 more trees and um, five more lar large shrubs uh, on the site. However, the condition of approval will require that the final landscaping plan include a one-to-one -one, uh, like or in-kind replacement for all non-heritage trees removed. Um, we found a nexus for that uh, under the subdivision um, standards. And so uh, trees will be replaced um, at a one-to-one -one ratio for non-heritage trees um, with a like kind or in kind uh, species. And um, if it is found unsuitable, if the site is found unsuitable to um, house that number of trees with the development on the site, then um, an in lieu fee can be uh, determined. And the in lieu fee is uh, based on the project? Um, it's based on, um, it's there's no set formula in our municipal code. Uh, it states that um, their own evaluation of the, the value of the tree will be determined. Okay. Um, and then for the replacement trees, what does the city require in size? Is it like a 24 inch box tree or what, what typical size is required for replacement? So for the, for the non-heritage um, trees, it'll be in kind. So it will be dependent on what's um, going to be removed. For the heritage trees, the applicant has proposed 15 gallon size trees. However, the condition of approval has um, stated that uh, the, the final landscaping plan shall include 24 inch box trees um, where fees, where staff can, or where the city can feasibly request for that size of tree. Okay. Um, another question that I had, sorry, looking through my notes, a lot of them were already answered. Um, Can staff touch on the history of the past denial of the project? Um, so I can touch on it uh, a bit, but the applicant may be the best person to maybe fill it in. Um, so from my review of the records, um, the and as described at the August um, 3rd uh, hearing, um, I understand that the project uh, was um, um, the project was uh, brought to the planning commission. Uh, planning staff at that time re recommended denial of the project. Uh, planning commission um, denied the project in, in line with staff's uh, recommendation. Uh, the applicant appealed that determination um, and brought it to city council. City Council at that hearing um, 
decided or uh, gave instruction to the applicant to um, provide design revisions based on concerns, uh, 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 geologic concerns of the, the project and, um, and traffic concerns of the project and to return to planning commission. Uh, with that direction, there was a time limit of when those, those revisions needed to be provided. Um, and the applicant ultimately determined that they weren't going to be able to make that timeline. Um, so that, that occurred in the 91, 92 timeframe. Um, and so uh, my understanding of the project from there is that they resubmitted in uh, 2002. Uh, they went through a series of incompleteness um, reviews. Um, then uh, in 2015, the application uh, through default was determined complete and the uh, the environmental review phase began. It didn't, um, it didn't um, initially start. We, the, uh, my understanding is staff was waiting on funding for uh, a few years. Uh, and then in, uh, in 2016, there was uh, some further conversation with the applicant and then in 2019, the, uh, the environmental review phase uh, officially started and um, brought us to where we are today. Okay, um, I, I'd like to see if the applicant has anything to add to that question. Yeah, Mr. Chavarri or, or Mr. Contrabecki, if you wanted to speak to uh, Commissioner Berman's question. Yes, yes, I can, I can definitely clarify it a little bit uh, what has happened through the years. Um, it, the application of 1991, the property belonged to Mr. Andy Bresling, a, lo a local realtor. And then um, he entered into contract to sell the property to a businessman from Venezuela. And uh, they hired an architect from San Francisco to design the project. And uh, I was hired as the local civil engineer to process uh, the civil aspects of the application. Uh, when the when the first project was denied by the planning commission, uh, you know, we had suggested to the owner a few modifications to the project, but uh, he did not approve of the changes. He liked the project the way he wanted, and then he directed us to appeal to the city council that decision. So we did go to the appeal. The city council gave us some directions, and uh, there were uh, certain things very achievable but at that point, uh, the gentleman from Venezuela decided that the project wasn't for him. He pulled the cord and decided not to proceed with the project. Um, the owner of the property, Mr. Bresling, uh, directed me to write a letter to, to the city uh, that, uh, with the intention to preserve some of the work that we've done in case that somebody else uh, wanted to work on the project. So at that point, the project went dead um, until 2002 when another group of people became interested on the property, um, uh, we reviewed the, the problems that the previous project had had, and that's how the project was redesigned from uh, independent little lots that were proposed on the 1991 design. And, and, and it was created as a condominium project now, and the houses were relocated so that they were sitting on the better portion of the site without the problems that the previous report originated. So we started working on the process and um, there were certain constraints, uh, particularly there was a sewer line um, coming down on Monterey Road that needed to be replaced and it did not have capacity for the new uh, sewage imposed by the project. Replacing that sewer line became completely infeasible for the project. It was too much money for this little project. So the project went dormant again and it stopped. Uh, when the school was uh, built, uh, they actually replaced the sewer line. And at that point, uh, the sewer did not become a problem for the project. And then the project was reactivated. Throughout that process, uh, Mr. Breslin passed away some of the other partners uh, also passed away some of them at a very early age victims of cancer and uh, the project 
walked at a very snail pace um, until a solid group, group of investors uh, led by Mr. Kontrabecki came about, bought the project and took it where we are. So in, in, a, in a very short summary, um, that is uh, the history of the project. So, Thank you. Um, Commissioner Berman, uh, further questions? Um, I have two more questions, and I saved these to the end because I'd like to hear what my fellow commissioners have to say about it as well. Um, the the wall heights, understanding that there is substantial grade on this site, I do have concerns with the wall heights. Well, I have concerns with the wall height and the back of the site, but um, I. I could tell from the staff report that it doesn't necessarily contradict uh, code requirements for the city or the general plan requirements. But the setback in the front of the site, the, the three foot wall height maximum, um, I, I do understand that there's several tiers of, of three foot wall height, but Visually, two tiers of three foot wall height from the sidewalk looks like a six foot wall. So um, I'm interested to see what the rest of the commission has to say or think about that. And then also wondering, I know this site plan has been this way for a while, but is there a reason why the units cannot be designed similar to the other homes on Monterey Road, where there's a dedicated driveway for each. I understand that would probably require either uh, joint driveways for, you know, for two units, you have one driveway and then two, two garages for each unit or the units need to be spread out. But I'm wondering, is there a reason why we need the, or the, the road in the back of the site needs to be installed? Uh, so, Commissioner Berman, uh, I think the applicant uh, provided some information uh, to that effect at the prior hearing and can probably speak to the um, traffic engineer considerations for, for safety that were evaluated uh, and that I believe led to uh, changing the project design. I think uh, before the applicant can speak to that point, I'll also mention that additional driveways um, leads to additional lost on-street parking. And that's another secondary impact of that type of project concept. Uh, and as we've heard from the public, um, loss of on-street parking is a great concern for this neighborhood. I guess quick question to add then. Um, is it now being proposed that the curb in front of the property is going to be red striped? Did I see that somewhere? There is a portion for the site safety distance for right. the um, entry and exit driveways as they're proposed. Uh, but I think you would expect to see a much larger impact to on-street parking beyond uh, the area red curved in this proposal. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess, can the applicant speak to, I'm sorry if this was talked about last meeting, I, I must have forgot, but why we cannot pursue or why it cannot be pursued to have maybe shared driveways at the front of each building to make the building structure a little more consistent with the, the other homes on Monterey Road where the garage is at the bottom with the driveway right in front of the building. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, the, the first and most important reason is what uh, uh, Christian just mentioned. Um, the traffic engineering report established that there is uh, very little sight distance um, in that section of the street for any vehicle to safely stop uh, if we had uh, driveways coming. Uh, as you can see, the road kind of winds around and a car coming out of a driveway in there uh, would not be easily seen from oncoming traffic. That's number one. Number two, uh, putting the driveways from the front substantially increases the excavation. The maximum slope that we can have on a driveway um, is 18% uh, on the steeper area, uh, an average of 15% of from the street. So that means that if we set the garages, even taking advantage of the reduction of a 10 foot setback that the code allows, we can only raise the garage about 
two and a half to three feet above street level. At that point, we will be cutting substantial amounts of dirt. And then if, if we scale the building behind, it, we, it will require more and more retaining walls. So we have the problem of traffic and the same problem of retaining walls. So we did an analysis uh, of the volume of excavation, putting the buildings accessing from the front opposed to what we have right now, and the volume of grading increased by about 30% from what we currently have. Uh, to your question of the retaining walls that are in the back, um, if we, we could very well uh, diminish the height of the walls and extend the grading further back up onto the hill. But in order to minimize uh, the grading as much as possible, we decided to tear the walls close together so that we don't disturb the upper portion of the hill and that we keep the development kind of in a tight space. The walls are constructed uh, with five or six feet of separation between one another, and those areas are going to be landscaped to mitigate the appearance of the height wall. So you will not see from the front uh, one single wall. You will see small series of work that are like act like planters and landscaping in between the walls uh, will minimize the bulky appearance of the walls. Um, furthermore, the bigger walls on the back are going to be constructed uh, using shot grid um, that can be carved uh, to mimic rock and soften the appearance. It's not just going to be a big massive wall, but it's going to be a tinted uh, concrete um, with some architectural treatment uh, to make it blend easier with the hillside. Okay, um, thank you. And of course you have certainly more knowledge on this site than I do. Um, I mainly asked that question about trying to find a way to put the driveways or, or garages somehow towards the front of the site in an effort to, I don't know if it's possible to reduce the amount of retaining walls and grading at the back of the site if there was no longer a need for the access road. Um, but I'm certainly going to defer to your um, analysis of the site. Um and then, oh, I also wanted to thank you, Mr. Chavaria, for your efforts in uh, studying the turning, the guest parking, and the uh, garbage management for the site. Thank you. Um, I might have more questions later, but I'll let others speak. Thank you, Commissioner Berman. Um, Commissioner Hauser. Um. Well, Commissioner Big Stick was next, but I see he took his hand down. Um, okay, uh, so I had a, a few questions. Um, one of them was, um, you know, I, I reviewed the, the 1992 peer review done by Cotton and Associates, um, and I appreciate the fact that um, the applicant has removed the keystone walls that were, you know, the gravest concern. I did see a note about geotextile fabric um, on the grading plans which I think was the, the rationale for the concern, right? It wasn't the keystone walls themselves, but the geo grid and all the excavation for that that was accompanying that. Um, I guess my question is maybe, I think this is for you, Mr. Shavaria, but it may, may, may also be for Shane, is um, it was unclear if that geotextile fabric referenced in the plans is, um, is part of the stormwater system or is that actually accompanying the walls for some reason? Um, yes. So you could clarify that. Yeah, of course. Uh, traditionally, concrete line swells uh, have been used uh, uh, behind retaining walls and, uh, and in hillsides. And um, just about every time those concrete swells uh, break apart um, as uh, soils move, uh, erosion occurs in the vicinity, uh, we ended up with non-functional uh, concrete swells, hard to maintain and uh, very problematic. So uh, through a lot of analysis and, and investigations, we came up uh, uh, with the concept of using a geo-reinforced uh, uh, earth swell. So basically, we will grade that portion of the hill behind the retaining walls, uh, I mean, just to create a swell. And they will have some geo-grid 
to reinforce the soils in that section and prevent erosion. So it, it's a greener approach. It uses less concrete. Um, it works better and it, and, and, and it drains better. It's basically a kind of a, a bio-treated type of drainage system. Uh, no concrete, uh, more stable, as is uh, if the soils move, then the geogrid moves accordingly and continues to work. Um, it's a better solution to a concrete swell, in our opinion. Okay, okay. so that, that answered my question. I wasn't, I just wasn't sure if it was for the walls. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I also can very much appreciate, and this kind of goes back to what Commissioner Berman was saying, that you're you're literally between a rock and a hard place um, with you know a 15 foot minimum setback requirement on the front edge. I was trying to figure out um, how you guys were going to address the massing and if there was a way to remove some of the retaining walls. And I think you know because you have to start that far back, I, I just didn't see a possibility. So I can appreciate that. Um, however, I did at the last hearing where we continued make the comment that I wanted. Um, to see stuff softened with landscaping. I thought that would be a great strategy. Um, and again, I, I also appreciate that, you know, staff worked out what I thought was a really well-worded tree condition, um, as well as, you know, you guys provided updated renderings with large um, landscaping. Um, I, have, I have two kind of bifurcated points on this. One is um, you currently are, are being required to provide a one-to-one non-heritage heritage tree removal. And for the heritage trees, you're, you're already providing 14 um, replacement trees while you're removing six. Would you be amenable to adding the additional four replacement trees to, um, uh, to meet the requests of Tree City USA? And also, um, you know, as, as I think one of the community members mentioned, there's a precedent set by council to, to have the three to one on a prior project. So would, would you as applicant be willing to add four more trees to this project? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, and then in that same kind of vein, um, again, I think the renderings do a really good job of adding kind of large landscaping and softening it. But when I look at the sixth page of the project sheet, especially, no, I'm not gonna be able to find it, but especially, I think where you guys added the majority of that large landscape, and you know, to, to um, the point that Ms. O'Connor said uh, earlier, is, um, you know, we're not really approving the renderings, we're approving the landscape plan if this moves forward. Um, I think that the majority of that large landscaping is on the north side. So as you're driving up the hill, you know, on, on Monterey, you'll see that. But I think that there are um, landscape pockets in front of units three and four, and potentially in front of unit seven as well, um, and in front of unit eight, where the landscaping that's on the renderings looks large and lush. But if you look at the key, you're providing, you know, one gallon grasses and um, other really small landscaping that doesn't grow very large. And I don't think that that kind of accomplishes the, the massing reduction that we had talked about. So um, I would like to figure out how to, you know, I don't, I don't wanna stop anything, but I'd like to figure out how to potentially work on a condition that um, spreads those larger landscape plantings further up the hill. Does that sound like a fair idea or does that work for you? Commissioner Hauser, if I, if I may interrupt. Um, condition of approval number 15 uh, does include language that states trees, uh, parentheses, 24 inch box or large shrubs, 15 gallon, uh, parentheses, 15 gallon, shall be required where feasible between units two and three, units four and five, and units six and seven. Um, so just making you aware of that. Yeah, thank you, um, Ms. O'Connor. I did see that. Um, I actually didn't interpret it the way I think now that, that you're saying it, I see staff intended it. So I think that makes me feel a little, a little bit better. Um, I think the clarifying point for me would be um, also in the landscape areas fronting um, units one, two, and three, rather than just between buildings.
So if, if we could maybe add some language to condition 15, I think that would completely resolve my massing concerns from the last meeting. So I think that's a question. I, I, I think I'm asking you, Mr. Chavarria. Oh, uh, yeah, we, we have no problem on enhancing the landscape plan to comply with that condition. Okay, wonderful. Um, And then I think the only other thing is um, there was a, this is a question for WRA. There was a um, community member that talked about the um, wetland delineation um, legally being required um, as a, uh, legally being required now as a part of the entitlement rather than a part of permitting. Um, can, I just want WRA to clarify for the record um, what the discrepancy in, in thinking is here, or maybe Rainey, whoever is appropriate. And that's concluding my questions at this point. Rod, uh, Mr. Stinson, would you perhaps um, provide the first response to that as to uh, the delineation and or the ability to defer that particular element of the project? Yeah, sure. and. Um and hopefully WRA can fill in the gaps if there are any. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's typical. The, the requirement for CEQA is to identify any potential impacts uh, related to wetlands. Um, their initial review of the site identified the potential for those wetlands, and, uh, and the mitigation is to get the appropriate permit. Um, and part of getting that permit is an official uh, verified wetland delineation. And so, uh, you know, part of the permit requirements come from uh, Army Corps, which provide the um, additional requirements of one-to-one of, uh, -one mitigation, which uh, was identified in the errata for that particular mitigation measure. Uh, WRA doesn't have anything to add to that. That's very succinct. Thanks, Rod. Okay, I, I think Commissioner Hauser, was that it for your uh, questions? Okay, uh, Commissioner Big Stick, you're uh, you're next up. Um, I wanted to speak briefly about trees because I also um, was in attendance at the city council meeting where they heard the uh, appeal regarding the Oddstead Way site that we had heard previously on Rockaway. And uh, that's when I heard them um, go ahead and do the three to one ratio on the trees. So this is at least in alignment where this has gone with council before uh, is my understanding. Um, a lot of the um, uh, tree city folk whom I'm absolutely behind fundamentally uh, we're speaking in terms of uh, a city tree fund and while um, it's an idea that in other instances might be very entertainable I don't know that this is um, the right venue to entertain the idea of the tree fund um, seems more like a city council kind of a place to bring up something like that but I did want to address it since it was brought up se several times and just tell you, I've heard you. Um, I think that city council needs to address that one. Um, but I, again, just wanted to address it. Um, just a, a couple little cleanup points from uh, other commenters. There were a couple folk who brought up the idea of a water table pushing against retaining walls, possibly. Uh, Mr. Shabri, if you'd address that, please. Uh, perhaps uh, I can have our soils engineer, Mr. Dykeman, uh, speak to that effect. Uh, all right. uh, certainly. Uh, thanks for that opportunity. Yeah, that's why we put drains behind the walls, is to pick up the water that's trying to get to the wall. If we didn't put the drains behind the wall, I agree, it would build up, it would back up, and it would actually overpower our walls because the pressure goes up uh, from uh, hydrostatic pressures to at least double or more what we would normally design for. So by uh, putting in drains, we actually make the construction of the wall substantially more economical. And we also take care of those pressures and we can control the water where it goes, decide how much needs to be restrained, how much can be allowed to trickle out. 
And we also keep the walls looking better because we don't end up with leaks in the walls where it actually comes through the face of the wall and, and stains the wall. So uh, the drains behind the wall, very normal thing. Uh, and uh, we, in, particularly in a bedrock situation, are usually our flows are pretty low. Uh, you'll get typically flows through the fractures as opposed to the, the body of the, of the materials. Uh, the rock itself doesn't let the water through, it just goes between the cracks, so to speak. So uh, it's fairly, fairly normal and conventional um, construction technique. I don't see anything unusual about this situation, this application. Thank you very much. Um, there was another commenter that, um, and I, I had read this in a few of the uh, comments that came through the email, um, something about our peer reviewers in the city not being named. I could swear that our peer reviewers are right here in front of us tonight. So if um, we could just bring that uh, to the surface for the record, please introduce yourselves peer reviewers or correct me if um, it is somebody else. Maybe we could ask staff to identify folks present. Who so, are Commissioner, Commissioner Bigstick, I, I recall the issue coming up with respect to storm water calculations. Is that the peer review that you're referring to? I believe so. Sure. So, uh, Mark Lander, could you please uh, identify who you work for and uh, your qualifications? Certainly, uh, Mark Lander, senior principal engineer with CSG Consultants. Uh, we have an on call contract with the city to perform stormwater reviews as part of new development. I handled the uh, review on this project, uh, registered license, uh, registered civil engineer uh, since uh, 1982. I've been doing stormwater work since the first stormwater permits came into existence back around 1990. Happy answering any other questions you might have. That was perfect, thank you so much. And um, another uh, questioner tonight asked, how will the uh, Homeowners Association be monitored? Uh, I believe the context was to make sure that um, they do what they're supposed to do in keeping everything clear of debris. So if somebody can go over briefly how that works, I'd appreciate it. So I think, uh, Commissioner Bigstick, there are uh, two or three parts to that. Um, I think uh, we mentioned earlier that there's a proposed condition of approval requiring an annual report to be submitted to the Public Works Department describing the maintenance work uh, performed by the HOA. Uh, additionally, um, stormwater control measures on the site as part of the city's municipal regional permit or MRP. You've heard us talk about C3. C3 is one of the sections of the MRP. Um, another uh, part of that permit requires inspections of the stormwater treatment measures on a periodic basis. I believe it's not less than five years, but there's also a percentage of facilities in the city that need to be inspected. Based on the city's current number of stormwater treatment facilities, it typically results in a more frequent inspection than once per five years. So that's another inspection component where the city establishes um, that proper maintenance is being performed. Um, and then uh, we also have the ability to respond to uh, any complaints that may come from the neighborhood to ensure compliance with the conditions of approval and the proper functioning of the stormwater uh, control mechanisms and drainage systems are maintained on the site. I think there's at least those three parts um, to the city's ability to regulate uh, and, and ensure that the proper maintenance uh, and function of the facility is, is performed. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if questions down in two places. Let me uh, double check over here very briefly. Um, I think I recall from the last meeting, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, once we get past this phase, there's a few more borings. Um, regarding the bedrock cuts of the site that are gonna be performed, correct? Maybe Mr. Chavaria can help me with that one. Um, yes, uh, um, through the process of the design, um, there is, right now we have a, um, a conceptual soils report uh, uh, that has done an analysis of the feasibility um, of the site to construct this project. Uh, during the design phase, we go to a design level soils report. It will have to address the slope stability analysis um, and, and a few other elements. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Dykeman can uh, uh, expand um, if you feel necessary, Commissioner Pinstick. 
Um, if, if Mr. Dykeman uh, feels like jumping in, I, I certainly welcome more data than less, um, not just for my elucidation, but for that of uh, all those who are tuning in to watch. Uh, yes, this is Dan Dykeman. Uh, we are planning on doing some additional borings, um, uh, probably a deep one at, uh, towards the middle of the hillside so we can more effectively gauge what the inclination of the groundwater table is. Um, that'll need to be done. We'll be needing to grab some samples of the bedrock so that we can test them for strength because as part of the review process, we've gone through the city's review consultant uh, and we agree. Uh, we have to do a seismic slope stability analysis uh, to make sure that we've got adequate strength of materials out there. And if we don't, that our walls are beefed up to accommodate those higher than uh, uh, normal forces. And, um, at one point uh, in the process, does that, does that boring uh, sample occur? Is that um, before you start uh, taking out vegetation, after you take out vegetation, where in the process does that happen? Ideally, that'll happen shortly after this process uh, that you're going through tonight uh, gets passed and we're actually on to the next stage of the process. Uh, no vegetation necessarily needs to be removed unless we have an issue getting the equipment to the spot on the site that we need to take the borings. I would anticipate minimal, if any, disturbance to vegetation. Thank you very much. Um, I do not have any more questions right now. and. Um... I'm ready to deliberate, but perhaps somebody else has more questions. I guess I'll take the, the liberty of maybe asking a couple of questions. And I, again, I, just a lot of comments on trees, and I just wanted to um, maybe direct this to the, uh, well, just to staff or the city attorney, whomever it's appropriate to. I, we had heard um, some proposals with respect to, uh, with respect to ratios, uh, three to one replacement for heritage trees, one to one for just to, uh, straight logging operations. And it sounded to me like a proposal to include a fee as well, or maybe maybe that's what I'm asking for clarification on, and oh, a fee in addition um, of $750 for heritage trees and uh, I guess $250 for um, trees removed as part of a log, logging operation. And I was curious about whether or not you would need something like a, I don't know, a nexus study or some something um, along those lines before you could impose a fee like that. So I was hoping you could maybe speak to that. Sure, thank you, Chair Noblin. Uh, I, I think we all uh, respect and value the, the trees in our community and understand the important function that they have. I think that's certainly the reason why the city has several different regulations governing uh, tree removal, uh, of trees of various types, heritage trees, non-heritage trees, uh, certain numbers of trees, et cetera. Uh, we do have uh, requirements res with respect to replacement of those trees in our municipal code uh, or other city ordinances. Uh, and there's no such replacement ratio uh, required. And so replacement may be required. And I think reasonable uh, limitations on that can be uh, imposed, whether it's two to one, three to one, depending on the impact being mitigated. With respect to fees, um, I'm only aware of uh, mention of a fee with respect to um, the Heritage Tree Preservation Ordinance, and it does have a prescribed method of determining the fee, and it's based on an appraisal of the tree's value. So I think discussion of any set fee outside of that context for a heritage tree would be inappropriate, in my opinion. Um, we would, I think, necessarily allow the process detailed in the municipal code for heritage trees um, to be followed. Yeah. With respect to non-heritage trees, uh, again, I'm unaware, perhaps my colleagues are aware of provisions in um, other ordinances or the municipal code addressing the fees. Uh, but with that said, um, certainly uh, fees are a very particular uh, body of law in California with respect to imposing fees generally. There's another separate set of considerations for imposing fees, what's called an ad hoc basis uh, or on a project specific basis. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, with the uh, replacement of trees specified, it would seem to me that that has addressed the project impacts uh, for purposes of uh, addressing them uh, within the commission's purview. It's not clear to me what basis we would have for imposing an additional fee on top of that or substituting replacement for payment of a fee. Should the commission wanna go that route, there is a very particular uh, process we would need to follow to determine what that is and make sure it's rational and um, related to the project impacts. And I don't believe we have enough information to do that tonight. I, I understand, thank you. Um, 
I guess another couple of questions. One, you know, there were some comments uh, that, that, that sort of went to the um, history of um, uh, the developer group and some concerns about sort of the um, the possibility of a, a project getting started, maybe certain things being done in the context of the project and then things stopping. And I was hoping maybe staff or, or again, the city attorney as appropriate can speak to the sort of the protections uh, that, that are kind of in place for um, for ensuring that, you know, if we end up with something that's partway done, we can um, ensure that we're able to mitigate sort of the, 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 the negative consequences to the, to the community if something like that were to happen. So I, I know it's covered in the staff report, but it might be worth it just to, to touch on that again. Sure, happy to do that. Um, and then uh, Assistant City Attorney Sharma can um, provide additional detail where appropriate. Uh, there's really two components to this project. There are subdivision improvements as part of the tentative subdivision map. Uh, and there are project improvements with respect to construction of the buildings. The subdivision improvements um, are, are covered by um, surety requirements in the city's municipal code, uh, either a cash deposit or bond or some combination thereof to ensure that uh, the, the estimated cost of the work is um, provided for through that financial mechanism to ensure the city has the ability to step in and complete the work or at least to render the site safe uh, if for some reason the grading or other subdivision improvements were only partially completed. With respect to the building component of the project, um, the city does have its nuisance abatement uh, authorities, uh, which are uh, general police power authorities. Uh, unfinished buildings, um, exposed excavated hillsides and so forth are nuisance conditions, which the city can abate through the civil nuisance abatement process, which uh, Ms. Sharma can articulate better than I can, uh, but there are remedies available to the city to pursue uh, completion of the work and to pursue cost recovery uh, where appropriate. So I think there's adequate legal mechanisms for the subdivision and the building components of the project uh, to ensure that we have a, an ability to render the site safe and also to recover the city's costs uh, where appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Murdaka. Ms. Sharma, anything to add to that? I would just say that uh, I echo Senior Planner Murdoch's comments and provide that we generally advise that the city's code enforcement process is adequate to protect the city in those circumstances. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sharma, while, we, while I have you, I, I had one other question. It was um, just a little note that I made to myself. I think it was um, one of our commenters, I think it was Ms. Hines, who had... Um, made a statement, I wasn't clear I was tracking it uh, candidly, uh, about sort of wetland delineations. And it was suggesting that there was something about the way we did wetland delineations, or maybe didn't, that was uh, that was not legal under the circumstances. And I just wanted to, one, insofar as I've got the comment right, or I'm, I'm, I'm understanding it at sure. all, if there's anything you could say to that. Sure, the way that I understood it was that a wetland delineation um, after approval would somehow be an improper deferment of a or formulation of a mitigation measure. Yeah. And what I would say to that is a requirement that a mitigation measure be developed in consultation with regulatory agencies can be sufficient under CEQA to ensure that potential impacts will be adequately mitigated. Thank you, Ms. Sharma. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Uh, are there any other questions at this point or does somebody care to uh, uh, move into the um, deliberation phase of all this? Uh, Commissioner Berman and then Commissioner Big Stick. Um, one of my largest concerns still is the massing of the site and just the, the scale, mainly because, you know, when I go to that road, I see the smaller homes in comparison to this project. And, and I do enjoy the aesthetics of this project on its own and the building, but looking at the surrounding homes on the site, it's, it is quite different. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what the rest of the commission especially those with um, better aesthetic backgrounds and architectural backgrounds than I have. Uh, I'm wondering people's thoughts on the scale of not only the buildings, I guess, uh, also the walls. Uh, 
would it be appropriate just to answer that or uh, chair would you like to call on us to answer that or um why don't you go ahead since you're since you're since you're, you're speaking yeah I, I, go ahead absolutely yeah um uh I, I am not opposed to conversation in this format. And, um, you know, personally, scale was probably, I mean, safety is my biggest concern, and I've tried to um, ask as many questions as possible. But after that, scale was my next big concern. Um, but the design guidelines, and I, I think I brought this up at the last meeting, and um, staff, maybe um, Senior Planner Murdoch, you can jump in briefly, but... Um, it, it seems to me I raised the, the question that usually when I look at the design guidelines in the staff report, there's a little bit there about how um, not all of the design guidelines need to be um, followed to the letter in order to approve a project, which is a little different than some of the other findings we go through. Um, so as I've been looking at it, while I do feel to a point it's out of scale, I don't know that it's out of scale enough to my sensibility um, that I feel comfortable putting a stop to the project based on um, that particular aesthetic alone. Um, and as sorry. far as, no, no worries. As far as that, sorry, a little tired it's at this point in the evening. Uh, it's been a long day. Um, as far as the walls themselves go, um, it's it's a little bit more difficult for me to visualize exactly how that's going to look because on the one hand I, I hear clearly and can visualize the concerns of Commissioner Berman and then on the other hand um, I have a slightly different visualization when I hear the description uh, of Mr. Chavarria. So um, if the description of Mr. Chavarria is um, to be fully discerned it, it sounds like it might not be as great a visual impact Although, again, getting back to scale and mass, um, in general, it is a concern. That's, that's what I got there. Anybody else uh, inclined to speak to this? Commissioner Hauser, what do you think? So, um, you know, this I, we talked about this at the last hearing. The scale is definitely one of the biggest concerns that I've kind of had. I mean, obviously, there are, there are a lot of other technical things that I think have been studied and talked about um, on infinitum. So I, I think for me, you know, there's there's a little bit of, um, you know, what's the context as you move south? And what I can appreciate, what I, what I actually don't think is going to be a huge problem is the fact that um, the next buildings over uh, are set, they're, they're not directly adjacent. So even though the side setback on that south, that southern property line um, is technically relatively small because of where the road is placed, I don't personally think that that's going to create kind of a scale issue. I think the biggest, the biggest issue I see um, is what I said last meeting, which is that, you know, between the grade of the road and the top of 35 foot buildings and I understand how we measure stuff in Pacifica and how we define building height. There's a 57 foot difference in a lot of scenarios. And so it's, it's kind of a hard, it's a hard question because on the one hand you have this 15 foot minimum front setback. And if you're going to sink down the grades, you're going to end up with this huge retaining condition. It's already a large retaining condition on the rear, right? So it's just going to get exacerbated. And you know, it's it's like you're pulling levers here. So I think from my standpoint, I think solving it with really good, well thought out landscaping is an important thing to do here. And I appreciate that there's a condition of approval where the director of planning, um, you know, has to approve the finish of the retaining walls and um, I appreciate that the applicant is open to a condition where we increase the landscaping, where we move the, the breadth of the larger size of landscaping further south. I think the thing that's a little bit difficult for me is um, by having this city, this, this municipal code requirement that all of those walls along the frontage can only be three foot high maximum, you end up with more walls and you also end up with smaller planting areas. So you like, you know, I, I believe 
um, and I'm not a landscape architect, but I believe that a five foot clear area with a root barrier would be a sufficient space to get like a really good healthy tree. But when you're only moving these things three feet laterally, it becomes a lot harder. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard position for the applicant because of their, because of the natural topography of the site. Um, and it's a hard position for us. But I, again, I, I do think, you know, as, as Commissioner Big Stick said, I think there's a way to get there um, if the landscaping is done appropriately. Mr. Godwin, what do you think? Well, I've lived in a n number of towns and quite frankly, almost all of them are more eclectic than Pacifica. And it's, you know, this need for uniformity kind of reminds me of Moscow where there's this massive block of things that are very, very similar. I think if you go look at a place like Paris, that the, they have very interesting buildings somewhat um, inserted into what, you know, for the last 120 years, I guess, since has been something they tried to keep fairly uniform. It's worked out great. Um, well, I think that's also true in London and New York. So I think we could afford to shake things up a little bit, in my opinion. Thanks, Commissioner Godwin. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson, uh, thoughts? I share the same concerns with Commissioner Bastic and Commissioner Hauser. Um, my biggest worry, I guess, is that I don't know the, the process that well yet. Uh, once it leaves this space, is this the last time for appointed representatives of the community to have a review other than just um, staff? I mean, we, we can we can send it on its way with the blessing saying, hopefully they mitigate this properly. You can look at an example like the um, retaining walls along 92 coming in and out of Half Moon Bay, and they look great compared to most retaining walls. But if you're walking up that creek side with, you know, not the need for a highway there, they look terrible. Um, Is there a way that they can make this work? Yeah, I believe there is a way that they can make this work. I believe there's a way they can make it aesthetically pleasing. I think it's architecturally interesting. Um, I think the design is creative and innovative, but does any of that negate the fact that they're putting 50 feet of retaining walls in a residential neighborhood where there aren't currently 50 feet of retaining walls? Um, that's where I'm left kind of not knowing where from here, uh, if we send it along, how do you stop that from ending up being the case even if, uh, the best intentions are there. Thanks, Mr. Ferguson. I, I get my, my own sense of things. I, I think I, I would um, echo or, or, or certainly agree with a lot of what uh, Commissioner Big Stick, Commissioner Hauser, uh, Commissioner Godwin, um, well, everybody uh, it, it has stated. Um, frankly, I, I, I'm not sort of too off put by the by the mass or the size. Um, I, I think that it's um, I think it's a, a, an interesting, uh, good design. I, you know, a thought that occurred to me that, I, that I'll just add to the add to the mix is that, and, and maybe it's not relevant, but it struck me that I mean there is. It sounds like there's kind of been a need, uh, you know, having having looked at the geotechnical aspects of things to to kind of bring the uh, development together in a way that maybe creates more mass than we otherwise would have if um, there was an ability to use more of the site. So uh, it strikes me this is probably um, uh, a, a good solution under the um, under the uh, under the totality of the circumstances I, I do agree with Commissioner Hauser that uh, there's going to be a real need to rely on some uh, on landscaping and and, and, and um, a lot of good thought around all that to, to debuffer and um, sort of soften things that, to the extent they can be so um, I guess that's everybody uh, who's spoken on that uh, particular issue and this all started, uh, Commissioner Berman, with, uh, I guess, a question or comment you had. So maybe we'll, we'll send it back to you, see if you had other thoughts or questions you wanted to add to the mix. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I appreciate the, I guess, additional comfort that commissioners have stated um, I mean, I certainly agree that enhanced landscaping will help the massing of the site and, and kind of 
screening the the walls, especially at the back of the site. Um, but I still have a lot of hesitation on just mainly the size and in comparison to the nearby buildings. Um, even the, I guess it's condos across the street, they're, they're a little more spread out and, and they appear a little smaller. They don't have the vast amount of retaining wall that this site would have. Um, and I'm no foreigner to retaining walls. I mean, I, I understand the need for them. Um, I mean, I, I personally kind of sit here and wonder if there's a different way to orient things to reduce the massing. Um, landscaping is certainly a good approach. Um, I kind of like one of the items that Commissioner Ferguson mentioned. I mean, this is the opportunity where the public gets to comment their concerns, and it is the opportunity where we get to ask for um, potential design changes or state our concerns. And especially now with a lot of the assembly bills and Senate bills, um, I mean, housing projects especially are in need and, and they could move forward without our opinions at all um, if they comply with, with uh, local jurisdiction code requirements and general plan requirements, they could move forward um, even without our our uh, comments and review. So um, this one's a tough one for me. Um, Commissioner Hauser. I was, I was pretty much gonna say what Commissioner Berman just said, which is, um, you know, in light of a lot of the state legislation that um, has come out in the past year or two. Like I, I totally concur that especially on a, a project where, um, you know, this has been reviewed a lot. Staff has done a ton of work on this um, very clearly and has come to the conclusion that this project is consistent with our land use guidelines. It's, um, it's you know, a privilege that we do get to comment on these things. Um, I think for me, I have um, two conditions of approval that I personally would like to see um, updated. Uh, one of them is the tree one, and I, I have some proposed language at some point when we get to that juncture, um, and then potentially incorporating more landscape uh, language around that based on the, the conversation we had. And the other is um, the condition of approval that pertains to the geotechnical report uh, being to the uh, satisfaction of the chief building official. Um, I think based on everything that we've heard tonight and how I feel, um, you know, it was very successfully peer reviewed um, at this juncture by, by you know, staff's, uh, I, I believe staff hired the third party consultant for the peer review. Um, I think it would be important to add that third party peer review process um, to the design level geotechnical report as well. Um, I think personally, those are the two things that I need to see to, to gain a level of comfort, um, like a baseline level of comfort around this. Commissioner Hauser, let me um, just uh, share with the commission, the city already has an administrative policy. It's administrative policy number 28. that requires just that, a third party uh, peer review of the geotechnical reports submitted for building permit applications. Uh, where there's any potential for civil engineering or geotechnical concerns. So it is something that's already part of the city's process. Um, perhaps, you know, the condition you're describing could just more directly refer to that and um, reemphasize the fact that, you know, in accordance with administrative policy number 28, ensure a peer review of future geotechnical uh, reports are conducted. Staff worded it in condition 30 as pertains to the, um, the, the I, I can't remember what terminology, but it was the stormwater portion that it would be a third party peer review paid for by the applicant. Um, I think just, you know, lifting that language off and putting it on 28 would be more than sufficient.
Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hauser. Um, Commissioner Bigstick. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, the conditions that uh, Commissioner Hauser has brought up. Um, we are uh, very fortunate that we get to have this review process, given that um, the project apparently is in alignment with our housing element. I was actually um, recently uh, had a conversation with um, a council member who uh, had uh, had told me that um, uh, I think it was CBAT, uh, CCAG, CCAG had recently come out with the, the new regional housing need allocation numbers. And it, it looks like our future numbers are substantially greater than they currently are at the um, number that got told to me was 1900. Um, I don't know if staff wants to comment on that at all. I wanna make sure I'm sending out proper information, but um, given that these numbers are apparently going up substantially, not down, and that uh, we are required to make sure that we're using our land in accordance with uh, what we have said we will use it for, um, that's big. Um, that aside, um, you know, I, it hasn't gone unnoticed by me uh, that the neighborhood has placed a substantial amount of concern into this project. And um, on the most fundamental basic level, if you strip away, you know, every bit of detail, this is a project that is is very large for a neighborhood this size. This is a project where under the most ideal circumstance, it means that the neighborhood gets to live with um, uh, a, a very large thing being incorporated into their neighborhood. And on, you know, an ideal day, that's, that's not an easy thing to uh, be asked to live with. And in this instance, there are a lot of very genuine concerns, especially about safety brought up. Um, those concerns uh, were, I, I was pretty well satisfied that I, I don't think um, safety at the end of the day is going to be um, as great a concern as it, it might have been when we began this process um, now a couple months ago. Um, I do wanna uh, bring back up that idea of a condition of approval, making sure that um, the uh, catch basin um, can handle a 100 year storm event. Um, again, I my concern chiefly is about safety and given all of the storms we have seen nationwide, not just in California and, you know, remembering a mere four years ago, that massive storm we did have and figuring that must be part and parcel to uh, climate change being what it is. Um, you know, I, I send it to the rest of my commissioners to tell me whether or not they agree, but I think that adding on that condition of approval for the uh, basin that can take on a hundred year storm event, that would satisfy uh, my concerns about safety, and I would hope uh, would at least in some measure address some of the community's concerns. That's what I have to add to it. Thank you, Commissioner Bigstick. Um, Commissioner Ferguson. I'll start by just uh, saying I agree completely with uh, Commissioner Bigstick and his um, adding of the 100 year basin that I lived on. Esplanade when uh, we lost instead of the usual five or six or eight inches, uh, 10 feet of bluff in one year. And I had a lot of neighbors lose their homes that year. Um, anybody that thinks that that can't happen is to, you know, had their eyes closed for a while. Um, so that's something that I thought about a lot because uh, that developer also uh, went through bankruptcy and left Pacifica with that bill. And then later, um, you know, we had congressional help, but uh, it's something that I think about a lot, uh, just given the, the scape of the scope of what's being asked of this hillside, uh, which leads me to the uh, point I raised my hand here for, um, I, I'm currently on a project in the city of San Mateo. We're a year in where, a boring that was done 10 feet from an excavation area uh, proved to have uh, just the wrong conditions and it's it's going to result in 
millions of dollars of changes. Uh, I worry that, it, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. O'Connor, but there was no boring done in the actual location where the buildings are going to be developed on this site. Uh, I worry that we could have a condition there that um, we're someone is walking into something that um, you're going to create a huge excavation and a, and a huge series of um, retaining walls held back, although I'm sure they're engineered correctly uh, without the proper borings in advance. Uh, you're asking the commission to approve a project that could be not right from the design. Um, I'm not sure who that's directed to, but uh, I guess if, if there's a if it's possible to put a condition in that a boring be presented that's actually within the area where the buildings are being developed, uh, I would strongly push for that as a uh, condition of approval. If I could ask for some clarification on that, uh, just so so I'm clear, I, I was under the impression that we need to get a geotechnical report that's uh, somewhat more detailed before a building permit could be. Uh, could be could be drawn for the project. Is that is that not right? That's correct, Chair Niblin. Um, as to the specific locations of borings, I don't know that that's been prescribed thus far. I think um, you know the evidence we have is that the site is likely to be adequate for development of these structures, but further investigation is needed to ensure the proper technical design for the building foundation and other structural systems. Um, you know, I'm not aware of anything that would prevent the commission from specifying that, you know, not less than one boring must be, um, you know, performed within the footprint of the building. Uh, but I think I would defer to uh, one of the qualified panelists we have here on the city staff team to maybe articulate that in a way that would be achievable for the project applicant and also obtain the desired technical outcome. Is there someone uh, from city staff uh, who can, who's got the geotechnical knowledge to speak to that? Mr. Roddicker, uh, would you be willing to uh, offer an opinion on that? Yeah, <clears throat> I mentioned this in an, an earlier response is, you know, I think everyone understands on the applicant side that there's going to be a design level geotechnical report for this project that will of course require additional borings. The applicant's geotechnical engineer um, mentioned as much earlier in one of the responses. So whether or not that becomes a condition of approval, you know, at a planning level, um, I, I guess is up to, up to the commission. Um, but I think everyone understands there will be additional borings on site for the design level study. The chair, I'm wondering if uh, before the commission, you know, embarks to prescribe the locations of the borings, perhaps we could hear from the applicant's geotechnical engineer as to where he might conceive of those borings being located. I, I note that there are four different buildings on the site, plus various locations for retaining wall systems. And so, you know, while well-intentioned, you know, it may not be um, you know, the best idea for the commission um, to prescribe technical details of particular follow-up geotechnical work. Uh, happy to do so. Um, Right now, the, the biggest issue that I have is wanting to make sure we get a boring in the location of the uphill retaining walls because that's going to be the area of our deepest cuts. Um, our buildings are actually may end up being on fill, which means I can't drill that because it's not there yet. Uh, I also have to keep in mind that I want to do minimal disturbance to the hillside when I do my investigation. So most likely my borings are going to be done on the existing cut benches that are already there because that's where I can get equipment. On steep slopes, I can't get equipment there without starting to regrade those portions of the hillside to get a level building pad for which that allows me to drill. So we'll be somewhat constrained by the uh, existing geometry of the site, but I really wanna be make sure that we get areas that are going to allow me to get to where we've got our deepest cuts and where we've got our most important foundations. Thank you, Mr. Dykeman. I, I guess a couple things I'd say. One is that, I mean, again, we're we're expecting, in fact, requiring a design level geotechnical report before building permits can be issued in this matter. Uh, it's also been confirmed that uh, such a geotechnical report is going to be subject to peer review, uh, either by city policy or perhaps by a, a condition of approval uh, that we we might add to the uh, to the mix. I I think prescribing the 
you know, at the planning phase, sort of the, the, the specifics of that uh, design level geotechnical report is probably beyond what, certainly beyond what I would be commonly used to seeing, frankly, in the, in, in the entitlements phase. And I, you know, I've done this for a long time as a, as a commissioner and frankly, uh, as an attorney for the county uh, where I do a lot of land use stuff. So I know this is a, a constant tension sort of where it is that, uh, that we get this kind of information. And uh, so it's not, uh, it's not a unique conversation with this project in particular, but I, I, my own sense is that's something that's more appropriately deferred, the specifics of where borings might, might occur. I have one other question, um, and it pertained to uh, uh, Commissioner Bigstick's uh, proposal that we um, require a catch basin that's uh, capable of uh, handling a 100-year event. And uh, I, I guess a couple questions. You know, one is that, you know, how much bigger uh, a, a basin are we, are we going to be talking about there? Um, you know, I, 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 it, and then just broadly speaking, it doesn't, you know, there's obviously going to be cost impact to all that. It, it doesn't strike me that it's always the, the best idea to, to design to the, or to build, I guess, to the, um, to sort of the, 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 the most uh, extraordinary cases. Uh, you know, we don't design parking lots to the, you know, to, to Christmas level um, shopping, for example, at, at, uh, at, at various places. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I, I have some concerns about that. I'm wondering what staff um, thinks. Agreed, Commissioner Nibelin. Uh I think normally it's uh, inadvisable to design to the 100% uh, event, if you will, or at least the maximum capacity that would be um, anticipated at all times. I think this project's um, it's relevant for this project in the sense that um, avoiding adverse impacts to the offsite storm drain system is important. Yep. Uh, and the applicant has uh, offered to provide this level of design uh, in order to prevent such adverse impacts. I think as to uh, the, the technical requirements to achieve that design for the 100-year storm detention, uh, perhaps Mr. Lander can opine on that issue. Yeah, certainly. Uh, well, first off, the three detention tanks are buried underground, so they can be whatever size they are, they're not going to be visible. Yeah. Uh, it's not like you're digging a larger uh, open basin to uh, store the water. The other is that uh, just kind of a rule of thumb that a 100-year uh, storm is probably two, two and a half, three times uh, the size of a 10-year storm. And we've already sized the, the tanks for 25-year storms. You're probably looking at maybe a you know, 50% increase, uh, maybe doubling the size of the tanks in order to get to 100-year 100, uh, 100 storage. It's not like you, you, you have, it's exponential. It's not, it, it, you know, 10, 100-year storm is not 10 times the size of a, of a tank. Yeah, I get that. Well, let me ask you one other question. I, and what's the additional level of protection that we're, we're achieving for offsite facilities relative, when, when, we, when we've got a 100-year, you know, bunch of um, tanks, I'm just going to use vernacular at this point, it's getting late, um, when no one else has got that level of protection and you've got all this other, you know, sort of water coming from all sorts of other sources that are affecting some of those same offsite facilities. Well, the answer is if there's a 100-year storm on the site, there's probably a 100-year storm around the rest of the city. So I think that was my point. We'll probably experience some flooding. I think that by providing the 100-year uh, detention on site, you can tell residents, you can tell people downstream that this project did not, you may have a problem, this project did not make it worse. Okay. Commissioner Berman. I was just going to provide my thoughts on that. Um, I personally don't feel a need to design the site to retain or even detain a um, hundred year storm. Um, as Mr. Lander stated, it's likely that the rest of the city is experiencing the same storm event. Um, often it's much more common for cities to design more public infrastructure to retain or manage just larger storm events. Um, and it, it's not very common that private property owners have to design to even a 25 year storm, um, but certainly not a hundred year storm. And, and I do know this site just from my review has overland release near the driveway. Um, so I don't have a personal concern of the property flooding or flooding nearby properties, assuming that the, the site grading would be done 
in a manner that is acceptable to the building department review, because I know that's a common building department review item to ensure that there's no um, cross property line drainage, even for overland release situations. Um, again, just I have other concerns with the project that um, that I don't think there's much of a solution to, but I did want to mention my thoughts on that. Thank you, Commissioner Berman. Chair, Chair Nilbin may I offer as well. I just uh, want to remind the commission that this issue of uh, stormwater drainage and offsite infrastructure, um, it was uh, a very critical issue raised by the public, uh, in particular in the first public hearing on this project, and additionally in a number of public comments on the project. Uh, and so I think, you know, I, I understand the commission's uh, concern potentially with requiring the applicant to design to this higher level. I believe I've heard a uh, willingness by the applicant to design to this higher level of yeah. consistence. And uh, by doing so, I think the greater number of storms that we can uh, document that the project would not exceed the pre-development condition in terms of stormwater runoff, the stronger the argument in the record that the project would not have adverse impacts to the offsite stormwater infrastructure, including uh, claims made about downstream erosion uh, to the creek into which these stormwater discharges uh, would enter. So I think it bolsters the, the factual record with respect to offsite impacts, which were a key concern um, to the neighborhood. Um, and I think I've not heard any evidence as to what adverse impacts there would be to the project by incorporating the applicant's uh, offer to design to detain the 100-year storm at this point. So I'm not sure what we lose, and I think we gain a lot is the simple way of saying that. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Murdoch. I, your point's taken. I, you know, obviously, if uh, the applicant is uh, willing to do it, and it sounds like it can be done in the, technically without uh, undue sort of um, issues on the on, on the site, I don't, I don't, I, I guess that was more philosophical and probably unnecessary this hour. So I'll, 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 I'll stop talking about it. Uh, Commissioner Hauser. I, I was just going to say that I would be you know, based on what exactly Mr. Murdoch just said, I would be willing to support the 100-year storm condition. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, and, and Commissioner Berman, I, I apologize if I'm singling you out, but you, you spent a lot of time talking about the sidewalk at the last meeting. Um, I, I've heard what everybody has to say on it, and I'm not, like, I'm. it's not a huge deal to me. Um, I do think there's a nexus for it based on the street and highway codes, but again, I'm not, like, I'm not going to die on my sword for a Chief Commissioner Big Six phraseology. Um, but I did want to hear if this was something that you were still concerned about. Yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, I, I don't, personally, I don't see a, a nexus that requires the sidewalk to be replaced, um, especially if there isn't any apparent damage. But I know we did talk about this in length during the last meeting, and it did seem like the applicant and everyone was kind of on board with the replaced sidewalk. And if anything, I think it's more of an aesthetic um, item that the project could implement. And it's it's a it's beneficial to the surrounding public as well. I mean, if only portions of the sidewalk are going to be replaced and there's new driveways and there's going to be a slurry seal of the road in front of it, which I think is a COA usually for projects of this size. Um, I mean, I, I would want the sidewalk to be replaced. I would certainly like to include that as a COA if we are able to. I wouldn't uh, be in disagreement that I do think there are some aesthetics concerns that, um, and then we have been talking about trying to mitigate aesthetic um, concerns. Uh, so, I, but maybe that goes to the uh, city attorney ultimately. I mean, is there, uh, you know, what do we think about, you know, how are we staying out or going off the rails um, from a sort of a Nolan Dolan kind of a perspective if we're, uh, if we're moving this direction? Uh, I feel like I would need to hear a little bit more about the existing condition of the sidewalks and how um, the project would have an impact on the sidewalk such that it would justify a replacement. 
Well, I guess another qu thank you, and I, I guess another question might be to the applicant uh, whether or not this might be something that they'd be prepared to, uh, perhaps in the same um, vein as the hundred-year storm event uh, situation. The um, well, this might be something that the uh, the applicant might be uh, prepared to um, agree to by way of a condition. And, and chair, if I may, um, just maybe to color the conversation, um, I'm not sure if senior civil engineer Dunginis has information as to the age of the existing sidewalk in this area. I think, you know, obviously I don't have to uh, deal with the budgetary concern for my development project if this project is approved because I'm not the applicant. Uh, I would think that selective replacement of some segments but not all of them may over the long term present a maintenance uh, problem for the HOA in that now they're going to have to replace these other segments at different times as well as they age and become damaged and uplift and so forth. And so there could be some overall benefit to the development by just doing them all at once, even if the city wasn't uh, in a position uh, or chose not to uh, require that replacement. Well, maybe Mr. Donguinis or uh, and or um, uh, uh, Mr. Chavaria might want to speak to that. Hey, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, I, uh, I walked the site several times and uh, the, the, the majority of the sidewalk that's not slated to be replaced are in good uh, working condition and they, they would last for another 10 years if, if you know, uh, no damage is done to them by construction equipment or, or some other uh, methods to, to destroy it. But uh, they... they as far as aesthetics would go, they, they would be a stark uh, contrast in, in color with the new concrete and the existing kind of darkened uh, sidewalks that's currently there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chavri, anything to add? Uh, yes. Um, the southern portion of the property, basically where the access driveway and the exit driveway is, all that section needs to be replaced. We have to create wider driveway. We have to create uh, the exit path. There is a portion of the sidewalk where the utility channels, uh, I mean, utility trenches are going to come, where the water in the sewer. So if we look at the general picture of the project, basically from unit three south, all that is going to need to be replaced by the means of the work. Um, the portion of the sidewalk that is currently in bad shape is approximately in front of where unit three will be. So uh, our contention is the very north end of the project, which is very low down, uh, that is an area that we're not even touching. It's, it's, it's like, a, like a little appendix of the project in there. Uh, if it's in good condition, if it's in good working uh, functionality, we don't see really any reason to replace that, not for aesthetic purposes, because it's not on the front of the project. And that replacing the sidewalk creates additional work um, on the pavement and in some of those areas. Uh, we are absolutely committed to have the best aesthetical appearance for our project. Uh, uh, I mean, we want to create something nice, something beautiful, and we're not going to jeopardize that by a bad looking sidewalk. So to the satisfaction of the city engineer, we will replace any portion that is necessary to be replaced for functionality, aesthetics, um, and safety of the public. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chavari. I mean, it occurs to me, I'll just add you know, to my fellow commissioners that they're gonna try to sell the, the units. I mean, they're not gonna want it to look bad. So I don't know, uh, Commissioner Hauser. Um. I mean, it's my, so again, I'm not going to die in my story for this, but my, my two cents is that the retaining walls go all the way to the northern property and they're the, the, you know, element that ties into the entire project. There are retaining walls along the entire frontage of this whole project. So my personal sentiment is that while the homeowners may only be seeing from where the condos start, people who are walking along Monterey, and looking at this as a holistic project or seeing it from property line to property line, because that's how the retaining walls work. It's not like there's like a 30 foot setback on the Northern portion where, you know, it's just landscaping and there's no retaining walls. So from an aesthetic standpoint, my preference would be to, to do the replacement. I think article two, section 5610 of the streets and highway codes makes it a very clear nexus 
But again, if this is not something that everybody else feels good about, I'll drop it right now. <laughs> Sarah, I wonder if we could ask um, Senior Engineer Dinginess as well. Are there methods to um, color the concrete, such as with lamp black or other uh, components to the concrete that would uh, tone down the bright white appearance of the new sidewalk to better match the existing sidewalk, which may not be replaced? I think uh, there is a process where you could uh, power wash the sidewalk to get the kind of the, the black uh, mildew that's stuck in between the, the granules of the concrete and that, that might help with the color. Okay. And that would be for the existing sidewalk sections. Is there anything to do with respect to the color of the new sidewalk sections to help allow it to better match the? Oh, oh yeah, yes. Uh, you you could add uh, color to the new concrete so that it will better match the existing. That's correct. Oh, like, kind of like distressed jeans or something. You know, like correct. To... Yeah, there's a there's a product called Lamp Black, uh, which is a, like a powder, black powder that you could add to the concrete to color it a little bit. Uh, but it's not white, white, uh, and it's a little bit more gray. Okay. Thank you. I don't know, colleagues, is there somebody who uh, at this point feels like they want to try to put a motion together? Commissioner Hauser. Um, so I think I, I'd probably be willing to put a motion together. Um, I would like to I think the most complicated part of this is going to be um, figuring out the wording for condition 15. So that's the, that's the landscaping and tree one. So I, I'm, I've taken a stab at it. And if everyone's happy with the wording, then I'm happy to make a motion with the 100 year storm condition. Um, and maybe Commissioner Big Stick can take a stab at that one. Um, the change that we made to condition 28, and I think Mr. Murdoch already has language that's, that's ready to be proposed for 28. I do, I do Commissioner Hauser. I think um, if it pleases the commission, um, doing this kind of uh, commission or condition wording on the fly is difficult. Um, I have tracked uh, suggested changes to the conditions of approval thus far. That I've heard the commission discuss. Um, if the chair would be open to it, uh, I think a brief recess to allow staff to confer over that wording and then uh, perhaps offer it uh, by reading it into the record uh, to make sure it uh, satisfies the commission's desires with respect to the project. That would be my recommendation. Mr. Murdoch, how much time do you need? I think 10 minutes would be sufficient for my purposes. Um, and prior to any recess, I would just want to confirm with respect to condition 15, was there a desire to increase the replacement ratio for heritage trees to three to one? From yeah, two to one? I, I had I had several text changes that I was hoping to float by everybody. So um, those, before we take re uh, recess, why don't Commissioner Hauser? Why don't we make sure we've got the grant? The staff has a grant, at least the high level grant. You know, sort of notion of what you're of what you have in mind. Sure. So for condition fifteen, um, it, one of the changes says. Um, it has replacement heritage trees shall be 24 inch box sizes when feasible. I would like to delete the words when feasible and make sure that those are actually 24 inch boxes. Um, I think there's a typo in there in the next sentence. Should a heritage, heritage tree be successfully relocated as analyzed under condition 15? I think that's supposed to say 14, but I'll, I'll defer to staff. I'm misreading it. And um, I think based on what everybody has talked about as far as a fee, I think deleting the last sentence, which says, if due to concerns of the health and success of landscaping, blah, 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 um, an in lieu fee shall be utilized. I think we just take that out and leave it as tree replacement. Um, moving the two to one ratio to three to one. And then I personally would like uh, to add a sentence at the end that says something along the lines of the applicant and the HOA successor will be responsible for the success of the new trees for a period no shorter than, I don't know, maybe like five years. Any failing trees should be replaced and replanted at the applicant's um, or successor's cost. Yep. And then, sorry, the, the only other thing is um, adding the larger landscape at the frontage um, in the places that um, Ms. O'Connor 
and I spoke about about 20 minutes ago. So, sorry, I know that's a lot for this one condition, but that's my feeling. Yeah, um, so I believe I captured most of it. So um, with respect to the last item, uh, I, I believe I explained at the last public hearing um, in response to a commissioner question, the landscaping plan is actually required to be maintained in perpetuity. So I think that there were concerns about um, replacement ratios and survivability, which in some uh, project contexts outside of this project are relevant. In this context where it's a small project and there's a precise final landscape plan, um, the conditions do require that in perpetuity and that um, the landscaping be maintained in a helpful condition or else replaced. And so I think that component is likely to be adequately addressed already. Um, and could you just, Commissioner Hauser, uh, state again your request with respect to the fees? You suggested deleting some language. I didn't follow. Yeah, that. there was the the final sentence of that con, of that paragraph um, said that if a licensed, qualified um, horticulturist, arborist, or landscape architects recommends against the on-site replacement, that the applicant could provide a fee. I think it would behoove the project. Um, to delete that, I think, especially if we don't, if there's been no nexus study on what the amount of the fee would be, and the fee only applies to heritage trees, and the applicant is the one providing evidence of the value, um, and there's a requirement, it's a long sentence, and there's a requirement to replace non-heritage trees, which have no value as well, then I don't think that this is a good, a sentence that benefits the public or the project. I think we want to just delete that sentence outright. Understood. Thank you. So I think I have uh, sufficient information for um, suggested edits to the conditions thus far. This is, of course, presuming a motion to approve the project, which may be forthcoming. Um, I'd like to circulate these suge suggested edits among the staff and make sure that we agree that the language is appropriate and, and then come back from a recess potentially to read those changes uh, into the record and see if they uh, meet the commission's desires for the project. Okay, well, we'll be in recess then until 1130. Is that is that sufficient time? Yes, thank you, Chair. All right, sounds good. We'll be in recess till 1130.
11.30. Um, Mr. Murdoch, I see uh, we've got uh, staff back. It looks like every member of the commission who was present before the uh, the break is uh, is reassembled. Um, so uh, I think at this point we'll go ahead then and uh, sort of delve into the uh, language that you all have uh, put together. Sure, thank you, Chair. We appreciate the recess and the opportunity to confer on that point. Uh, let me draw your attention uh, to packet page uh, 125, and I think more particularly getting down to where condition number 15 is on packet page 128. Uh, we'll pick up our discussion at that point. So uh, revising the second paragraph of condition 15, which I think carries on to the next packet page. Um, I will read the proposed revised second paragraph in its entirety into the record. The final landscaping plan shall include a tree, a tree replacement plan prepared by a qualified horticulturist, arborist, or licensed landscape architect for replacement of the six removed heritage trees with like kind or equivalent substitution in terms of species. The replacement ratio to removed heritage trees shall be at a minimum three to one ratio as agreed to by the applicant. Replacement heritage trees shall be 24 inch box size trees. Should a heritage tree be successfully relocated as analyzed under condition 14, the relocated heritage tree shall count as one replacement tree in the tree replacement plan. The tree replacement plan shall also identify like kind and size equivalent substitutions for all removed non-heritage trees at a one-to-one -one ratio. Trees, parentheses 24 inch box, or large shrubs, parentheses 15 gallon, shall be required where feasible in the planter areas in front of units one, two, and three, and in the planter areas between units four and five and between units six and seven. End text for condition 15. I got one thumbs up. Uh, so moving on, we'll go down to condition of approval number 28. I'll read that in its entirety. Applicant shall incorporate all recommendations detailed in the letter geotechnical investigations for proposed new townhouses at Monterey Road, Pacifica, California, dated April 2002, as updated by the letter Monterey Townhouses, Monterey Road, Pacifica, California Geotechnical Report Update, dated September 2nd, 2014, and letter Monterey Townhouses, Monterey Road, Pacifica, California, response to geotechnical review comments, dated August 3rd, 2019, and approved by the building official prior to issuance of a building permit, except as modified by the MMRP in Exhibit B. In accordance with the city's administrative policy number 28, the final geotechnical report shall be peer reviewed by an engineering consultant for the city, and it must be found acceptable to the city as is or with recommendations. The applicant shall pay city the cost of the peer review, including the costs of staff time and any services determined to be necessary by the building official. End text. And then moving down to condition 31, read it in its entirety as revised, applicant shall update its stormwater treatment plan with the construction drawings to comply with all applicable requirements of provision C3 of the municipal regional permit, including but not limited to demonstrating that sufficient treatment areas have been provided to capture and treat stormwater from all impervious surfaces created by the project. In addition to stormwater treatment systems required by provision C3 and is volunteered by the applicant, the applicant shall demonstrate sufficient design details to detain the 100 year storm to the satisfaction of the city engineer. All necessary stormwater treatment measures shall be installed prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy. And that concludes the uh, modifications to the draft resolution that um, staff heard the commission discuss prior to the recess. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch, and thank you to uh, staff for the very quick work on that. Um, I think I want to go back then to Commissioner Hauser, who uh, uh, prior to the break was, um, and without the benefit of, uh, actually you had some really good text already pulled together, but uh, now we've had the benefit of, uh, of staff working on it as well. But I'm wondering if with that additional um, uh, material to work from, you, you, you'd be inclined to make a motion at this point. Sure. Um... I will make the motion. So I'll, I'll move that the Planning Commission 
adopts the resolution, including um, conditions of approval in Exhibit A um, with modifications as um, read by staff on conditions 15, 28, and 31. And the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, MMRP, included as Exhibit B to adopt the mitigated negative declaration and MMRP for the project to approve site development permit PSD-714-02 use permit UP-904-02 and subdivision SUB-204-02 and to authorize removal of heritage trees and logging operations and to incorporate all documents, maps, and testimony into the record by reference. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner Hauser. So we have Commissioner Hauser's motion. Is there a second? I will second Commissioner Hauser's motion. So we have a motion and we have a second. So I'm gonna call for a roll call vote. Commissioner Berman. Yes. Commissioner Bigstick. Yes. Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Godwin. Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. Commissioner Nibble. Yes. And that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. What I'll uh, state at this point is that anyone who's aggrieved by the action of the Planning Commission has 10 calendar days to appeal the decision in writing to the City Council. If any of the above actions are challenged in court, issues which may be raised are limited to those raised in the public hearing or in written correspondence delivered to the City at or prior to the public hearing. Judicial review of any City administrative decision may be had only if a petition is filed with the court not later than the 90th day following the date upon which the decision becomes final. Judicial review of environmental determinations may be subject to a shorter time period for litigation, excuse me, in certain cases, 30 days following the date of final decision. All right, uh, we'll then go on to um, communications and we'll start with commission communications. Commissioner Bigstick. Chair, and after that very long deliberative process, I just want to say thank you one more time to staff for having put all that together and uh, bearing with us as we try and do the best job we possibly can. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And that having been said, one more thank you to the community for wearing those masks. Um, as somebody who gets to spend time in the community all day, every day watching people come and go from the store, those masks are being worn. I'm quite certain lives are being saved and thank you for doing that um, as we get through it. And that's all I got. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Bigstick. I don't see any other uh, hands for commission com communication in deference to the hour. We'll move on to a staff communication. Thank you, Chair. Just one announcement. The uh, Association of Bay Area Governments or ABAG, uh, they'll be releasing the draft uh, regional housing needs allocation or RENA methodology. Um, as I think was mentioned uh, earlier in the meeting, uh, that methodology as recommended currently would assign the city over 1,900 um, housing units under the RENA. That's up from 413 housing units in the current RENA assigned to the city. And uh, staff will be forwarding a memo to the Planning Commission uh, this week with some additional details on that process and what it means for the city. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. All well, right. there's, well, eight more, there's going to be eight more houses to contribute. <laughs> there we go. Well, they say a journey of a thousand miles, right? You got to start with a step. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Bigstick, did you have something else? Yeah, I was about to make a motion unless you object. <laughs> I, I absolutely do not object. Go ahead and make a motion. Uh, as would seem the way in this instance, I make the motion that we adjourn. Great. Do I have a second? Commissioner Hauser. I second. Great, right, let's have a roll call on that, please. Commissioner Berman. Yes. Commissioner Bigstick. Yes. Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Godwin. Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Hill. Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank, we're, we're adjourned. Good night, everybody. Good night, and thank Good you night. very much.